<laughs> There's no need, no need. <laughs> but libraries so hold a special place in my heart, so. We're ready, Mayor. Okay, very good. <clears throat> it's six o'clock and I believe that we have everyone here. So I'd like to gavel in <clears throat> tonight's meeting. It's the regular meeting of the Boulder City Council for Tuesday, November 17th. And I will start with a few announcements. Just give me one moment here to get these up. <clears throat> okay, so the first announcement <clears throat> is that the state of Colorado has announced that a mobile digital COVID exposure tracking application has been launched to help individuals be aware if they have been close to someone who has had a positive test for COVID. This application is available for cell phones running Google Android or Apple iOS and is secure and anonymous and will provide those signed up with a notification if someone they were near test positive for COVID. Over 15% of Colorado's cell phones have already loaded this application, which is expected to reduce COVID incidents by 8% already. Please sign up to increase your own protection and that of fellow residents. More information and the application itself can be found at www.addyourphone.com. And I will attest when I put it on um, my iPhone, it was super easy. You just go in the menu and turn the feature on, which you should be able to find in the menu now. And then the second announcement <clears throat> is that tonight we will have a couple of items under matters from the mayor and members of council that will require a motion to select or approve. We will open a public comment period 
after both items have been discussed by council. Um, and just a note, matters from mayor and members of council comes at the end of the meeting. If you'd like to speak during this public comment period, please email the city clerk's office at cityclerkstaff, all one word, at bouldercolorado.gov with your name and a phone number. The clerk's office will respond with an email containing the link to the meeting. Registration for comment under matters will begin now and will conclude at the end of matters from the city manager, which is right before um, matters for mayor. Um, staff is working on a process for public comment under matters item um, and hope to have it in place soon. And the issue of how to testify on matters which have a motion um, will be taken up by council in January at the retreat. And then again, just a reminder, if you'd like to speak during public comment under matters near the end of the meeting, please email the city clerk's office with your name and phone number at cityclerkstaff at bouldercolorado.gov. And with that, Debbie, would you please call the roll? Council member Brockett. Present. Friend. Here. Joseph. Present. Nagel. Here. Sweatlick. Here. Wallach. Present. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Young. Present. Here we have a quorum. Very good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I would like to begin the meeting tonight uh, requesting a motion to amend the agenda. We have several items that need adjusting on the agenda tonight. First, we'd like to move the approval of the 2021 council meeting calendar to item 8B and then move the 2021 retreat discussion to item 8C, <clears throat> move the 2020 performance evaluation and salary adjustment for the city attorney and municipal judge to item 8D, and then add item 8E, which is uh, COVID enforcement discussions. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Anyone opposed to amending the agenda? Seeing none, we will consider the agenda amended and we will move on to open comment. And just give me one moment. I'll try and bring up the comment list. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to pop open my email to get that. Apologies, but I added up. And here it is. <clears throat> All right, very good. In our open comment tonight, the first we so some reminders before we start. Each um, person will have two minutes to testify under open comment. Um, we ask that testimony only be on items that do not have a public hearing tonight. Um, our two public hearings, as soon as my agenda comes up, our public hearings tonight are. Um, Item 5A, which is the policy statement, and uh, and item 5B, which is the uh, Duchamp Bay Tea House landmarking. And I guess I'll amend what I was going to say. Both of those items do not have any further public comment tonight. So at open comment, you can testify about anything. And we would remind everyone to try and keep your comments civil and to neither attack city staff nor other um, citizens commenting uh, who might say something you disagree with. So with that reminder, we'll start tonight's comments with Margaret LeCompte, John Carroll, and Jason Hubbard. Margaret? I just want to confirm with Taylor that she can pull up the timer. I was just going to interrupt and say, we're having trouble with the timer tonight. Right. Um, I, so I, I, um, <laughs> I, have, I have it on my phone, but we won't be able to see it on the screen at this point. Um, but I will, you'll hear that you should be able to hear the buzzer when it goes off. For whatever reason, we're just having trouble with the timer this evening. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are we ready for Margie? Okay, Margaret LeCompte, you should be able to unmute. I just got the command. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. I, I should be just two minutes. So um, should, tell me when I should begin. I don't see the timer. You're good you to go, start. Margie. Okay. I want to question the haste with which the annexation project is being rammed through. 
So you won't develop it, see you south property for several years. In fact, its annexation proposal makes it clear that it's not even really ready for authentic negotiation over annexation details. Annexation is a very consequential and expensive step for the city. Given the pandemic's impact on all Boulder residents, much more time is needed for authentic public engagement. Second, city decision makers are not paying attention to the huge loopholes in CU's proposal or its references to CU's sovereign status that exempts it from any federal, state, and local rules. These will nullify any agreements that are not spelled out in an airtight annexation agreement. Remember, the annexation agreement constitutes the only legal constraint on CU's behavior at CU South. But throughout CU's proposal and and the city's briefing annexation book, unresolvable conf conflicts are dismissed with phrases like, this will be resolved once an annexation agreement is signed. This should be an absolute non-starter. Procrastination is not a viable negotiation strategy. It's simple capitulation. Once the agreement is signed, it's game over. CEO or any other later owner can do anything not specifically forbidden in the agreement. Finally, CU's annexation proposal shifts many costs of constructing its campus to the city's taxpayers and utility ratepayers. How? Because CU, if, uh, because if more land is needed for flood mitigation, CU requires the city purchase it from CU's open space other property. But that land is in the 100 year floodplain. So CU requires that the city fill and raise that land out of the floodplain, then grade it to be shovel ready for CU's construction. This adds 30 to $50 million to the flood mitigation project costs, which will be paid for by increases in Boulder residents, utility bills, water, sewer, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, stormwater assessments. But filling in land so CU can develop it is not protection against flooding or part of stormwater drainage. It's really a scam, and it's, it's like a tax increase without permission of the voters. So please slow this train down. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. Next, we have John Carroll, Jason Hubbard, and Sarah Wright. John? Uh, thank you, Council. Uh, my name is John Carroll, and I live on Koala Drive in Boulder. Uh, I'm here today to comment on the CU South annexation. Uh, as someone who lives in a neighborhood adjacent to the CU South property, I am incredibly excited to see this project progressing and look forward to the numerous benefits annexing it will bring to our community. One of the many benefits annexation would bring is to allow CU to build housing, a small step towards solving the housing crisis our community is facing. Annexation will also protect most of the property as open space or parks for the community to enjoy, securing it for future generations as well. The park and open space will provide opportunities for the community to enjoy the space through sporting events, dog walking, and more. This will also provide the opportunity to allow the city to enhance and restore the existing wetland areas. Most importantly, annexation will allow flood mitigation at South Boulder Creek to move forward. This is an incredibly important project for community health and safety that promises to move as many as 3,500 residents out of a high hazard flood zone. This is why it is a project that continues to remain urgent for many of us. The briefing book does a great job capturing all the work, thought, and effort that has been put into this project over the years, and we look forward to a productive discussion around it tonight. To city staff, council, and boards who've worked tirelessly and often thanklessly to get the project to this point, I offer a very sincere thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Next, we have Jason Hubbard, Sarah Wright, and Daniel Katz. Jason? Jason, we... I just we can... muted him. Um, he appears to be having audio issues. Let's try again. So Jason, I think you're gonna need to go check your technology. We cannot hear you and when we can hear you, it's very garbled. Perhaps okay, we could we'll, come back to him on the list. Yep, we will. Um, so we'll come back to Jason. Next, we have Sarah Wright, Daniel Katz, and Jordan Lewandowski. Uh, Sarah? Thank you. I'm Sarah Wright, Boulder native, born and raised, and I'm with the Colorado Foundation for Universal Healthcare. Tonight, we're asking you to join with more than 40 U.S. local governments 
and take a stand urging elected officials to enact improved Medicare for All now. Those cities include Seattle, Los Angeles, Cambridge, Durham, Ann Arbor, South Bend, St. Paul, Philadelphia, and yes, Jamestown, Colorado. Our US healthcare payment system is like a labyrinth that makes it difficult for doctors to get paid and patients to appeal. Our health insurance companies built this labyrinth so they wouldn't have to pay their bills. Most family, city, and school district budgets are burdened with rising premiums, deductibles, and co-pays, all to navigate a maze that's rigged against us. Each small tweak to this system makes it more complicated and more expensive. The simple solution is to have one nonprofit payer for healthcare. Scores of studies show it's the most cost-effective way to cover everyone. The people want this. 69% of Americans want improved Medicare for all. Yet despite what we want and what the evidence shows, we're still stuck in the maze. Why? Because of the greedy who make insane profits by denying healthcare or overcharging for life-saving medicines. We Americans with one nonprofit payer could collectively bargain for fair drug prices just like all the other countries do, including Canada, where their death rate from COVID is less than half of ours. Here, Black Americans die twice as often from the COVID virus as white people do. Health expenses drive 8 million of us into poverty each year. Imagine if every person in Boulder had access to affordable health care right now, including quality mental health care. Please make the moral choice for legislative policy language strong enough to help the providers and people of Boulder. Please stand for improved Medicare for all. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> Next, we have Daniel Katz, Jordan Lewandowski, and Nishama Abraham. Daniel? I am not seeing a Daniel Katz in the meeting. Um, Daniel, if you're in the meeting, if you could shoot me a note under the Q&A, we can circle back to you. You might be in the meeting under a different name. I suggest we go on to Jordan in the meantime. Great, Jordan. Hi, my name is Jordan Lewandowski. I am a family nurse practitioner at Clinic of Family Health. First, I wanna thank the council for giving me the time to speak to you today on the rising health insurance costs in our community. Growing up, my family had insurance but remained fearful of going to the doctor due to the co-pays and premiums. My parents once waited six weeks before taking me to be evaluated for a fractured collarbone. An injury which has now become arthritic in adulthood, adding to my annual medical bills. <clears throat> Healthcare costs in the United States have continued to rise and are anticipated to increase at a greater rate in the future. The Kaiser Foundation found that private insurance remains a major driving force of increased growth in per capita spending. In 2013, the United States spent $9,000 per capita on healthcare compared to Canada, which only spent $4,500 per capita. In 2016, 16% of US families reported problems paying medical bills. While we spend more on healthcare, disease burden or disability adjusted life years remain significantly higher than countries with a single payer system. Removing competing insurance companies and the associated administrative complexities could save $600 billion per year nationally with further savings through bulk purchasing of medications. A systemic review in January found a near consensus in studies funded across the political spectrum that single payer would reduce health expenditures while providing high quality insurance to all US residents. I'm asking that the city council join our US representative, Joe Neguse and Governor Jared Polis in formally supporting single payer universal health care coverage at the state and national level. Please take action and replace the language currently in the 5A policy document, item number 50 encouraging lawmakers to determine which approach can provide the greatest access to affordable quality health care for the greatest number of people at the lowest cost, to language that shows support for universal health care and Medicare for all. Thank you again for your time. Wear a mask and stay safe. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, Sarah, I just texted you about Nishama needing a link. Yep, so, I've just asked Debbie to make sure she sends it to her. So perhaps we can come back to Nishama in just a few minutes after she has a chance to come into the meeting. Yep, and our next our next speakers are Jeremy Reynolds, Amanda Berg Wilson, and Laura Tyler. Jeremy.
Hello. Uh, sorry, to, uh, my Zoom restarted. Um, good evening. Uh, so first, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for your time and effort. Flood mitigation in South Boulder Creek is a complex, critical problem for many who live in South Boulder. And as a community member, I truly appreciate the effort that has gone into the identification of the problem we're solving, the design of the proposed solution, and the cumulative effort that has gone into collecting feedback. As a resident in South Creek 7 neighborhood, I'm truly grateful that we as a city can come together and take an evidence-based approach to supporting our neighbors whose homes and livelihoods lie in more dangerous floodplains. This seems like it's a thankless job with many people who object, so I just want to express my gratitude. Kudos to all of the work that has gone into this project, and thank you. That said, one of the biggest concerns I have about the project is the amount and degree of misinformation and fanaticism that I hear. I have seen absurd, racist ads in the daily camera, and I've heard all sorts of concerns from my neighbors that, frankly, look and sound like misleading propaganda relative to my understanding of the proposed work and potential outcomes. Now, I'm 100% willing to acknowledge that my understanding could be flawed and that some doomsday scenarios could happen in some remote universe, but I haven't seen the data to justify such projections. The core question that I would like to pose to the council and committee working on this project is, how will you battle this misinformation? In order to try to tackle the issue of misinformation, I would ask a follow-up. Do we have a good understanding of why people are so fanatical about their objections? Is it that people simply like the current space as it stands today and think that there are no possible ways to improve upon it? Is it that people simply do not understand the severe risk that our impacted neighbors currently face? Or is it that people understand the risk that simply aren't willing to help them? It's likely some combination of the above, but understanding motivations can help, may help the city gain more traction and develop more actionable campaigns to deal with the source of the misinformation. I would encourage you all to treat the disease, so to speak, and not the symptoms. Please seek to understand the root causes and motivations of the objection so that those can be addressed as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> Next, we have Amanda Berg-Wilson, Laura Tyler, and Lori Preston. Amanda? Amanda, you may have to press unmute. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Council. I'm Amanda Berg-Wilson, a local theater artist and the artistic director of the Catamounts. I wanna thank you so much for restoring the $100,000 to the arts budget. In doing so, you ensured that the Catamounts, a Boulder-based theater company dedicated to theater for the adventurous palette, will receive our full $10,000 operating grant in 2021. Receiving this operating grant in full ensures we are able to move forward with an online interactive theater piece we are producing in collaboration with the Denver Center this February, March. This piece also has an integral food and drink component woven into the experience and we'll be partnering with a local restaurant to provide and deliver this food and drink to our audience at home. With this full funding secure, we will be able to serve in an arts residency at Creekside and Heatherwood Elementary Schools leading their second graders through the process of creating and performing their own work. This funding ensures we have the staff resources to be able to create two versions of the residency, an in-person version and a virtual version, depending on where the students are learning from. We're also so grateful to Create Boulder who have awarded us an additional $1,000 grant. With these additional funds, we're able to take risks on a new format for bringing folks live theater at this moment, like the virtual interactive experience mentioned above. Additionally, we will be using a portion of our Create Boulder grant to develop One Way Back Day, a stated adaptation of Black American folk tales being created by an all BIPOC creative team. I'm so grateful for your understanding that this funding is not a handout, but a necessary investment to ensure a vibrant and prosperous community. Council member Joseph's point about the arts addressing equity in a broad way was also so salient. With these funds, we'll be partnering with local businesses, providing much needed employment to diverse groups of artists and leading students who have suffered so much lost opportunity, dur opportunity during this pandemic and empowering experience of creating their own art. I am deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. <clears throat> Next, we have Laura Tyler, Lori Preston, and Lianne Arayel. And I'll point out that uh, Nishama, I believe, is on the call now. So we'll come back to Nishama after Laura. Laura? Good evening, everyone. This is Laura Tyler with the South Boulder Creek Action Group, and I want to thank you for this chance to speak. I'm here to 
night to address the public engagement process for um, annexing CU South. And first, I owe a big thanks to you, Sam, and Rachel Friend as well for your leadership on the subcommittee meetings. Those um, are challenging meetings, and you've done a really great job with them. And then also, Phil Kleisler, your work on the briefing book, um, I'm just humbled um, and thankful for the work that you've put into that. It's factual, it's interesting, it's easy to read. Um, thank you so much for that. And the most interesting part of the briefing book for me has been learning about the city's plans to work with CU to build a public safety facility that would include relocating fire station number four onto the CU South property. So we know that the fire risk in Boulder is high. We know that Boulder also has the highest risk of flash flooding in the state of Colorado and locating a public safety facility on land that's designed to mitigate flash flooding sends a strong positive signal that we are resilient. Um, and then I wanna respond to Jeremy Reynolds comment before about the misinformation. Um, I agree wholeheartedly that's a problem. It's been ads in the daily camera as well as stuff on next door. And this did come up at the planning board meeting a couple of weeks ago. Peter Vital had an excellent suggestion and that would be to add a myth busting or a debunking section to the briefing book. I think that's a fantastic idea that uh, we absolutely support. And then my third and final point, I've been chatting with my neighbors about what people in our neighborhood would like to get out of the annexation process in addition to flood mitigation. And there are two ideas that are rising to the top. And the first thing is about dog walking on leash and off leash. We know there's a demand for both. And then the second thing is pedestrian access. Our neighborhood is cut off from the CU South property and adjacent open space because of US 36, Table Mesa and Foothills Parkway converging. And so if you could kindly make sure that there are opportunities to weigh in on both of those issues, dog walking, and pedestrian access. We would be very grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Okay, <clears throat> I think we're ready to go to Nishama. Sarah, Nishama's number is the one that ends in 8252. Okay, terrific. Yes, I do. I'll turn her on right now. Nishama, if you're on the phone, you probably need to press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, we should be able to hear you now. Can you speak? Nishama, we can't hear you. Can you speak up into your phone and check that your phone is not muted? Yeah, how's that? There Perfect. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, technology. <laughs> um, well, good evening, Boulder City Council members. I hope you are all well and your families stay well during this COVID experience. Um, I'm a 30 plus uh, year resident here in Boulder and I'm speaking tonight to ask for Boulder City Council to withdraw from the Rocky Mountain Greenway. You may know that there is plutonium, radioactive plutonium particles that are in the soil and that is well documented. Um, there was a soil sample test in 2019 that found a reading microcuries of over 260. And that is exceptionally dangerously high. There's a, a, there's a soil sample done in um, New Mexico where the A-bomb was actually tested, and that's 200. And humans are not even allowed on that land in New Mexico. So um, the Broomfield City Council has withdrawn from um, the Greenway, and it makes sense because it's just dangerous. I mean, um, the people who will be first at risk are the workers. You know, the, the proposed plan is to put in a, um, a bike path, and the people who would build that, if we are looking at how do we achieve racial reparation in our world, it'll be people who have to take that work, because they, even if they know the dangers. So let's not put anyone at risk. The workers um, and then the people, I mean, would you allow, I surely wouldn't allow my children or a niece or a nephew to um, 
go biking across a place where if the wind picks up and those particles fly, um, you know, 75% of that land is not remediated. That's why it's so dangerous. And one particle that gets inhaled into the lungs lodges there. That's what, that's how lung cancer is caused from radioactive plutonium. So Thank you. again, Thank I ask you. you, please withdraw. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nishama. Next, we have Lori Preston, Liana Rael, and Elizabeth McGuire. Lori? Hi there. Good evening, and thank you so much for this opportunity to be here tonight. My name is Lori Preston, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of the Museum of Boulder. And tonight with you as city council members and representatives, I'm going to focus on three words that end with the word city, <laughs> authenticity, reciprocity, and audacity. Number one, with the authenticity, we are authentically grateful for the city of Boulder's reconsideration of the $100,000 for arts and culture in Boulder. A special added thank you to Create Boulder and their gift of $50,000 along with their expressed and our similar mission to expand our shared cultural ecosystem. We are so pleased to have gained 48,000 through the Boulder Arts Council and to have also received this additional check from Create Boulder. And with it, we provide educational programming, community voice driven uh, conversations, exhibit curation, collection protection, etc. And since the beginning of the museum and its new location at the corner of Pine and Broadway, we've had your support. Uh, Bob Yates in particular, we are forever grateful again to all of you. Much gratitude with authenticity. Number two, reciprocity. Um, as a civic cathedral of sorts um, in the heart of downtown, we have been able during this time since March uh, to help out some others. Boulder Symphony, Downtown Boulder, NARF, uh, Boulder Valley School District, Sansushi, um, Boulder Opera, Open Studios and Parks and Rec. And right now we have a powerful and very relevant exhibit drawing parallels that encompasses different ways to think about and respond to overwhelming events across decades in Boulder. As a matter of fact, all BCH employees are invited for free into the museum until January 1st, 2021. The third one, audacity. We are approaching the museum's significant losses right now with programmings, um, incoming school groups, you know, all those reductions in admissions, et cetera. We're plugging along with doors open six days a week and Wednesday evenings. And we've written and have hopes for grants that will help further provide a voice for communities in Boulder. Thank so you, with Lori. gratitude, yeah, with gratitude, thanks so much for the time tonight. Thank you, Lori. <clears throat> Next, we have Liana Rael, Elizabeth McGuire, and Kathy Joyner. Liana? Liana, you should be able to unmute. Okay, am I unmuted? You yes. are. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to read a statement. I'll just mention I'm a legal resident, uh, but I'm Canadian and I certainly miss my health care. <laughs> um, okay, this is my statement. To be strong, we must know our foundation and live accordingly. Our human foundation is the indigenous people whose land we are on. The beautiful OSMP master plan posits Indigenous people as one among parallel groups to reach out to. Actually, Indigenous people are host in this valley, all the, recent, all the rest recent guests, willing or not. To clear the air we breathe and open viable paths ahead, let's feed City Council Resolution 1190 into the master plan born at the same time. The people on this planet known to sustain and restore environmental ecosystems are Indigenous. The five focus areas of the master plan all relate in concrete fact to indigenous expertise, knowledge and culture. Indigenous is not a one liner. It is the bedrock that must permeate the plan. Hiring indigenous people directly rather than those who have studied their knowledge is most effective. Qualified indigenous personnel in every city department should be the norm. Indigenous people honoring their own distinctions and specificities of place, nation, culture, context, 
need to drive this process. Immediate concerns are Fort Chambers site review, city manager and assistant, interpretation along RTD multi-use paths and throughout the valley, race conversations coordinator, et cetera. 55 indigenous, 55,000 indigenous citizens live in Denver Boulder. Their distinct voices are crucial. The Arapaho's traditional home is this valley. Arapaho and Cheyenne people are the authority at Fort Chambers. Hiring has to implement this. RTD paths call for interpretation by tribal nations and local indi indigenous Thank citizens. Thank you, Thank Diana. You. I Next. Next, we have Elizabeth McGuire, Kathy Joyner, and Jan Burton. Elizabeth? Good evening. I'm Elizabeth McGuire, Executive Director of the Colorado Music Festival and Center for Musical Arts, as well as a member of the Boulder County Arts Alliance Board. I would like to sincerely thank the City Council for restoring $100,000 to the arts budget. I have also been notified by Create Boulder that our organizations uh, will receive substantial money. For us, it's $2,000 from their matching funds promise. My organization is considered extra large <laughs> and therefore will receive combined funding from the city and create Boulder of nearly $50,000. This support of our general operating expense in 2021 allows us to maintain our current level of staffing, which is necessary for the increased workload of planning for both live and virtual events, which, which we are doing both. Programs we are particularly proud to be launching in 2021 include the Center for Musical Arts Mariachi Bands, offering beginner to advanced curriculum-based musical programs in collaboration with the I Have a Dream Foundation of Boulder, and the Colorado Music Festival's world premiere commissioned work by a celebrated young African-American composer named Joel Thompson, who is known for his haunting work called Seven Last Words of the Unarmed. Our world premiere composition will be based on the writings of Stephen Baldwin with guidance from author and chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, Eddie Glaude. Just to give you an idea of the scope and potential reach of this project, actor Christopher Plummer has reached out and indicated his interest in narrating the work at our concert. So I know many of my arts colleagues like Amanda and others who've spoken in Boulder are planning their own incredible and impactful works in many ways, we as artists are well equipped to represent the voiceless, human emotion, tragedy, and hopefully great triumph that we have and will experience this year. Thank you so much for allowing us to respond appropriately and for allowing us to serve our community. I hope we make you proud and I thank you sincerely for your work. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next, we have Kathy Joyner, Jan Burton, and Patricia Carden. Kathy? Thank you. Um, I'm Kathy Joyner with the South Boulder Creek Action Group. And first, I'd like to send kudos to Phil and other staff for their considerable effort in producing the annexation briefing book. This is an incredibly complex project, and this document has been extremely helpful for understanding the process. Many of us are grateful for staff's work. Reviewing the document, I was struck by the number of issues on which the city and CU already agree, including the all important issue of flood mitigation, by far the greatest community benefit in its direct, positive and lasting effect on 3,500 Boulder residents. I was also happy to learn more details about the potential for environmental restoration and enhancement, as well as the potential for reestablishment of habitat connectivity by way of levee removal within the OSO tract. It appears that the parties are in agreement that the city will receive 44 acres of OSO land at no cost, assumed to be added to city open space acreage. It's good news to know that it's also possible for the city to purchase additional acreage from CU within this tract for city open space allowing for additional environmental restoration and, and, and enhancement in a comprehensive manner. I'd like to end with a last thought about environmental impacts. In reviewing the OSMP packet for Wednesday meeting, it appears that, if the, that the latest analysis of an upstream option has again shown that it is not the least environmentally damaging alternative when compared to variant one 100 year design. And this is a critical issue for permitting. In addition, it also appears that the upstream option will result in increased environmental impacts to city open space. Given that, I encourage you to provide final and decisive direction to staff 
when appropriate and as soon as possible, allowing them to concentrate their efforts on the all important variant one, one 100 year design and permitting. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Next we have Jan Burton, Patricia Cardin and Paul Coleman. Jan. Good evening, Mary, Mayor Weaver and Council. A recent report by Colorado Creative Industries summarized the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on Colorado's creative economy from April through October of 2020. The music, theater, dance, and visual arts sector in Colorado has lost an estimated 27,000 jobs and over $1.4 billion in sales revenue between April and October of 2020. This represents a decrease of 41% in both revenues and jobs. Of course, Boulder's arts and cultural organizations have faced the same staggering declines, which you heard about during the budget proceedings. The great news is that the Boulder City Council, the Arts and Culture staff, and the Arts Commission have been the one steady hand. After Council restored $100,000 in grants budget for 2021, the Arts Commission decided to fund the general operating support grants at 100% for 37 beloved organizations in Boulder. You can imagine the impact of this when they have faced revenue declines of 40 to 80% due to closures and cancellations. In addition, Create Boulder, as promised, is raising an additional $50,000 and will be providing grants to the same 37 organizations before Thanksgiving, enabling them to fund a project and employ artists as soon as December. So on behalf of Create Boulder, Thank you for restoring the budget to the arts. Your commitment to this nonprofit sector is crucial to their survival and to our community's recovery post COVID-19. Good evening. Thank you, Jan. Next we have Patricia Carden, Paul Coleman and Nicole Spear. Patricia. I hope I'm unmuted. You're good. Oh, good. Um, I thought I was limited to one minute, so you get a break from me, I guess. Um, <laughs> what I would like to first um, speak about is commending both Mayor Weaver and Councilwoman Rachel for their commitment to leading the monthly process meetings. I've felt connected and able to follow along with the city's progress um, toward annexation alignments with CU, and I greatly appreciate that. Um, and second, my thanks to Phil Kaiser for a very impressive and comprehensive annexation briefing book, which provides history and illustrations on its, I think it's 67 pages plus, um, anyway, um, when I think of all the clippings that I have stored in this folder, I just love Phil for condensing all that. It's just wonderful. And I, before I put in my plug for what I'd like to see, um, I have to second John, um, John's comments and Lori, Laura Tyler's and Kathy's, and I'm, I consider myself an adjunct member of that group. And, um, and I'd also like to support comments about the arts. I'm so pleased that that passed. Um, so many wonderful things are happening in Boulder, and it's thanks to this council for being on top of it. So my, my point right now is as a senior living in this historically flooded South Boulder neighborhood, I applaud whatever transportation efforts are going into a pedestrian or a bicycle underpass uh, to eliminate the current hazardous means of getting to this property and reminding you that we no longer have bus access in this area either. So there are many who are carless in this area and um, all of those accesses to this property are important. I also wanna speak in thank support you. Thank of- Thank you, Pat, Pat I'm oh, sorry, your gosh. time is up. The dog park, I love it. I'm okay, sorry. thanks very much, Patricia, Pat. Um, next we have Paul Coleman, Nicole Spear and Steve Pomerantz. Paul? 
Good evening, council members. My name is Paul Colden, and I live in South Boulder. Um, the election's over, so we move forward with an Excel franchise that the voters determined to be our new option. Um, COVID is raging, and you guys have to deal with that. So stay safe and keep your distance and wear your masks. And But keep global warming on your radar. Uh, I have been and will be focused on Boulder's climate goals of 100% renewable electricity by 2030 and 80% overall reduction in carbon emissions for the city by, of 80% by 2050. Um, I consider these goals to be a floor, not a ceiling. We can and should do even better. I'm going to work with you, Council, and with staff with an emphasis on keeping the progress made and challenges encountered visible to the Council and to the public. You know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you just look around at what other cities and other utilities are doing, we will see concrete proven steps we can take to increase renewables and decrease carbon emissions. Uh, maybe staff is already working on a plan. Uh, if so, let us know. Don't keep us guessing. Uh, please task staff to make a plan that includes dates and present renewable milestones. Um, your top legislative priorities should be shutting down all coal-fired power plants in Colorado by 2025. And CCE, Community Choice Energy, should be right up there too. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next, we have Nicole Spear, Steve Pomerantz, and Patrick Murphy. Nicole? Good evening, Council. My name is Nicole Spear, and I live in the Tanter Park neighborhood adjacent to CU South. First, big thanks to Phil and all the staff involved in the very informative briefing book and the strong community engagement strategy. It's good to see the city and CU aligned on so many components of the annexation agreement. Not being in danger from flooding in my neighborhood, I have the privilege of focusing on the recreational aspects of this annexation. And I'm thrilled about the benefits this emerging annexation agreement could bring to my neighborhood. Having a dog park would benefit the many dog owners in the area, like myself, who don't have fenced yards. A publicly accessible running track would keep people from having to run laps around my street as they do currently. And having a fire station close by would be really comforting in this era of rapidly spreading wildfires. These possibilities for my neighborhood are exciting, and I worry that progress in imagining possibilities risks being stymied by misinformation. Some citywide groups have been spreading misinformation about annexation via ads in our local newspaper, flyers posted on our mailboxes, and signs along the informal trails that connect us to the CU South property. The goal of these efforts seems to be to encourage us to oppose annexation rather than to join in the planning process in a collaborative, constructive way. If there's not a strong plan for countering this misinformation, I worry my neighborhood will lose its opportunity to engage in thoughtful discussion about what we want to see in the annexation agreement. As Phil and others move forward in the coming weeks and months, I hope Council will make clear to our community that annexation is not optional and that the intention of this engagement process is to shape this land and its future uses. Our city has the benefit of brilliant residents. If we can get past our fear of change and unleash our creativity, we can use this annexation process to envision a future for CU South that benefits all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> Next, we have Steve Pomerantz and Patrick Murphy, and then we'll, we'll go back and check in to see if Jason Hubbard is still uh, available to speak. Steve? Steve, it looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, I think he perhaps is having problems with his microphone. You're unmuted, Steve. We can see you're unmuted. Can you try talking? Yes, Steve, we can't hear you. Um, <clears throat> you might try coming back into the meeting and see if that helps. You could also check uh, if you're on Zoom, near the mute button is an audio settings if you click on the up arrow. So we'll, we'll move on for the moment and come back to Steve and Jason. And next we have Patrick Murphy. My name is Patrick Murphy. I live in Boulder. The pandemic and the climate pandemic are directly related and Red Cross notes that the devastating effects of climate change exceed the devastating effects of the pandemic. 
Among the reasons the Muni has ended is the fact that the Muni has been the slowest and most costly alternative path to carbon reduction we could have ever devised. Time is of the essence, and I'll be poking and prodding you to step up the pace of real carbon reduction. I hope to find honest and frequent updates that are on par with the COVID updates. The true measure of success will not be indirect, slowly evolving <clears throat> efforts, but rather immediate and direct changes, such as those of the plan B with equity that I've presented to those of you who would listen, or at least pretended to listen. A quick start would be the conversion of all our streetlights to LEDs, as all our neighboring towns did years ago. The reasons we didn't do this years ago are ludicrous, and those reasons hold less water today. Distributing LED bulbs with priority to low income is direct action and reduces everyone's power bills. Solar incentives and wind incentives are far simpler and cost effective than running a legal battle for the next two years and far less costly than hundreds of millions in debt to fund and construct a money losing muni. Let's rock and roll and cut carbon with collaboration. Hopefully Muni supporters will be as critical of Boulder's efforts as they have been of Excel's and push for progress and not dwell in non-productive nostalgia. There's no need to end critical review of Excel. There is a need to apply the same review to Boulder. That's been sorely missing for the last decade, thus the election results. The Muni is done. Let rapid carbon reduction begin. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> okay, so we have a few people on the stack. Um, we have got Jason Hubbard, Daniel Katz, and Steve Pomerantz to come back to. Do we see Jason in the meeting? I go. do, and I'm allowing him to unmute now. All right, can you hear me? We can, okay. that's much better. Okay, apologies for my earlier technical difficulties. Thank you for your time and your patience. My name is Jason Hubbard. I'm a physical therapist practicing in the Boulder area. Tonight, I wanna to focus on throwing some verbal weight behind the argument for the city council utilizing and endorsing language specifically in support of improved Medicare for all. What I'm not going to do is spend a lot of time going over the technical and, te and logistical concerns surrounding improved Medicare for all as other speakers before me tonight have already addressed many of these concerns. Instead, I'm going to focus on what I think is an oft overlooked, overlooked piece of this puzzle. Specifically, the real question here in my mind is a moral one. How can we as Americans stand by while nearly 45,000 of our fellow citizens die every year due to the lack of healthcare coverage? As a leader on the world stage, our callousness towards our neighbors across the country in this regard is staggering. There will be technical issues with any solution to our current healthcare problems. That isn't what we need to address here and now. What we need to address is our current systems utterly failing to protect those who need it the most. On top of failing to meet even the basic standard of providing care for those in need, our current system is even more damaging precisely because of its for-profit nature, which lends itself to bias and prejudice along class and racial lines. Finally, as the cherry on top of this mess, our current system has failed to keep people safe in the midst of this pandemic as people lose jobs and therefore health co healthcare coverage and are forced to swim the chaotic waters of applying for, attaining, and maintaining their own health insurance as a very small fish in a very large ocean surrounded by those who could not care less for them so long as there is profit to be had. In short, our healthcare system is failing us. Improved Medicare for All is our best and quickest way to provide for the needs of our fellow citizens. We need to make this change, not because of technical minutia, but because genuine compassion and empathy require us to make a moral decision that supports the health and well-being of everyone around us. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> Next, we have Daniel Katz and then Steve Pomerantz. Daniel? The police oversight panel is nothing more than political theater that gives the thin pretense of reform while changing nothing. Right now, all final decisions on disciplinary action are made by the police chief. But with the new oversight panel, all final decisions on disciplinary action are made by the police chief. The cops aren't going to police themselves. In New York City, the police follow the review board's recommendations in less than 20% of cases. Boulder will be no different. The Minneapolis Police Review Board received 18 complaints about Derek Chauvin and failed to act on a single one. Simply put, if review boards worked, George Floyd would still be alive. It is pure fantasy to imagine that this oversight panel will have any positive effect. I remind you that this is not a theoretical problem. Officers Smiley and Lola Ty are just two examples of the rampant brutality and violence your constituents suffer on a daily basis. You should disarm, defund, and abolish the police. But at the very least, you must give the community final say over which trigger-happy goons get to walk our streets. 
There's another topic I need to bring up. As I'm sure you're aware, another of our unhoused neighbors has died on the streets of your city. Advocates have been calling into these meetings for months to demand more shelter space be made available and warn you about this exact problem. Let me be clear. You knew this would happen and you made a choice to do nothing because you do not fucking care. As I asked you back in October, how many more people need to die? You all have blood on your hands, but I would like to say a very special fuck you to Bob Yates, who asked the sheriff last week if unused buildings could be converted into additional jail space because you would rather leave people on the streets possibly to die, criminalize their very existence, and then forcibly imprison them instead of giving people the shelter that would make all of that unnecessary in the first place. Use unused buildings for shelter space, not jail cells, you absolute fucking cretin. In closing, I wanna say this slowly because I need y'all to understand. People live or die based on the decisions you make. This is not a fucking game. Take your responsibility seriously. Okay, that was very eloquent. Next we have Steve Pomerantz. Can you hear me now? We can. We can. Okay, cool. Steve Pomerantz, 335 17th Street. As I said in my October 1st email to you all, the process around the XL franchise and utility occupation tax extension ballot measures had numerous apparent charter violations. I request that you do an immediate independent, independent investigation of these issues and appropriately address the findings. That will help repair some of the lost trust. Charter section nine requires all council committee meetings to be public, but the mayor's and deputy mayor's meetings regarding the franchise were not. And leaving aside the charter issues, this was not the open process that you all agreed should happen at your May 12th meeting. Charter sections 108 through 127 include numerous requirements for items that must be included in such franchises. But these were apparently ignored in the fran XL franchise, except for the required vote and non-exclusivity. -exclus Looks like nobody was even aware of many of the other items. And charter sections 18 and 18A state that ordinances must be published at least 10 days before final, final passage. The notices for the franchise and UOT ballot item ordinances were published and attested to by both the mayor and the city clerk, but were apparently sent in the day before their second reading vote took place. So they also deceptively indicated vote counts, which no surprise given the timing were wrong. Also, the notice for the UOT extension was for ordinance 8416, but you actually passed 8417, which was substantively different. So that notice failed to meet the charter requirements, presumably invalidating the final vote in 8417. So in addition to an independent investigation, I suggest that you have the process be fully open and public from now on. That may help establish credibility and trust, which really needs it. Thank you, Steve. Okay, with that, we will close public comment and turn to staff and see if staff has any responses. Um, Chris? No comments from me tonight. Nor from me. Very good. I'll turn to council and see if there are any comments or feedback. Uh, Rachel and then Bob. Rachel? Um, I just wanted to pass along a general compliment. I've noticed, um, in emails and one person tonight as well that um, are muni advocates. So the election did not go their way, but they have quickly sort of pivoted towards making the best of the situation and giving us ideas of where to go from here. And I just wanted to say, I appreciate that as a um, council person and it's helpful and I wanted to give a compliment. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Bob? I also wanted to extend a thank you on a different topic. I wanted to thank um, Create Boulder and specifically Jan Burton for making it easy, quite frankly, for city council to restore $100,000 in arts spending in the 2021 budget by offering and, and now fulfilling that um, commitment of a $50,000 match. I don't think that we would have been able to do that without Create Boulder and, and particularly Jan Burton's leadership. So those those arts organizations that came to thank us really should be thanking Create Boulder for putting together a nice package that was um, able to um, allow us to continue to fund arts and culture in our community. So thanks, Jan, and thanks, Create Boulder. Thank you, Bob. Mark? Uh, yeah, uh, this is more of a question for Tom. Um, Steve Pomerantz raised a number of fairly technical charter-related issues, um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot with no notice. Um, so if it's not appropriate to respond tonight, is, is, 
But do you have any thoughts? Uh, let us know. But do you have any thoughts concerning any of those issues? Um, uh, well, we, we have addressed the, the Section 9 issue. Section 9 has goes to meetings of council. Um, as you'll recall, council was careful not to appoint a subcommittee. We generally require open meetings if council delegates authority to council members to make decisions as part of a subcommittee. That would make them a governing body under the, under the Open Meetings Act. Uh, council member Yates and Mayor Weaver were invited by the city manager to participate. They had no authority on behalf of council. Their only responsibility was to re report back to council, which they did. So we would not treat that as a meeting requiring uh, compliance with Section 9 or the Open Meetings Act. Uh, the, the other sections that he mentioned, sections 108 through 110 or 120, we've looked at, I believe, the franchise uh, uh, comply with each one of those, but I'll reach out to Mr. Pomerantz and see what specific things he thinks are mentioned in those. The, with respect to the notice requirements, I'd have to defer to the clerk's office. I do remember there was some mistake in the notice, but I believe we cured that. Uh, and uh, De Debbie's nodding her head. So uh, if, if that's a satisfactory answer, I'll proceed along those lines, Mark. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Seeing no other hands, <clears throat> I'll jump in here. Um, briefly, I just want to give an update. Uh, we've heard from multiple people over some time here about the Rocky Mountain Greenway. Um, I, I sit, for what it's worth, on the Stewardship Council for Rocky Flats. And the Rocky Mountain Greenway issue, I believe, and staff will confirm this later, but I believe we'll get an information packet sometime before the end of the year. And then we'll have reason to return to that uh, at the first of next year in the first quarter. Any decisions that we need to make as a city regarding the Rocky Mountain Greenway and our participation don't need to happen until the first quarter of next year. And we will probably learn more about some of our partners um, and their participation by that time. So that's just a brief update. Um, we will be returning to it. So um, I'm happy to take questions from council or, or any members of the community about that. Um, but, but rest assured, we will have a public decision-making process associated with that. And then I would just say, um, in regards to some of the slurs about our police officers, I want to say that I don't, and I believe most of the council doesn't believe that our police officers are, quote, trigger-happy goons. I think there are um, folks who are working hard for the city, um, doing an incredibly difficult job. And I would further say that um, you may call out any members of council that you would like, but to the extent that you're trying to make a point and get people to listen to you, direct insults and profanity directed at specific council members probably isn't gonna help your case. So with that, I think we should move on. And uh, next, Debbie, you wanna lead us to the next step? Absolutely. Um, next we have um, the consent agenda and on tonight's agenda, you have items A through J. Very good. And Chris, I will turn to you. I know that we had talked about having a small presentation on item E. Uh, are, are there any other um, consent agenda items that council might have questions about? If not, shall we address um, section E, which is, or sorry, um, item 3E, which is the um, North Boulder subcommunity plan and the streetscape on North Broadway. Correct. Thank you, uh, Sam. And um, before Jean jumps into uh, a quick presentation here on the new streetscape plan, I did want to take this opportunity, um, since this is an item related to planning and development services, to introduce our new director of planning and development services, Jacob Lindsay, who started yesterday. Uh, and so Jacob's on day number two. He joins us um, uh, from Charleston and there he was the director of planning preservation and sustainability. So uh, Jacob is gonna join our team and um, we'll be um, jumping into continuing the improvement work that we've been doing in NDS as well as all of the, the projects that the department has. So I just wanted to be able to welcome Jacob to our team and to introduce him to council uh, and I'm sure you'll, you'll see lots of him uh, through, throughout the coming months. Well, uh, thank you, Chris, um, and good evening, Mayor and members of council. Uh, 
As Chris mentioned, I've just relocated to your uh, unique, beautiful, and important city from Charleston, South Carolina, where I held the equivalent position for five years. Um, I am humbled and incredibly grateful for the opportunity to serve the community of Boulder uh, as your new director of planning and development services. And I'm looking forward to working with the world-class staff, all of your appointed board members, and of course you, uh, mayor and members of council. So it's uh, with the utmost gratitude and respect that I say that there's no other place in the world uh, that I would rather be. And I'm ready for the challenges and opportunities presented by this incredible city. And uh, finally, thank you uh, to Chris Meschuk uh, and for everything you've done during my hiring and onboarding process. Um, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Jacob. And with that, we'll uh, turn it over to Jean. Great, thank you, Chris. Good evening, council members and community members. Um, the purpose of this item is to adopt very limited revisions to the North Boulder subcommunity plan. As you know, we um, amend these plans very infrequently. This amendment um, would replace the street section diagram and description for Broadway in the commercial area with one that reflects the refined design for North Broadway resulting from the community and decision-making process that occurred over the past few years as a part of the North Broadway reconstruction project. The refined design and construction project will implement the overall goals of the North Boulder subcommunity plan to encourage walking, biking, and transit use by providing safe and comfortable and convenient connections. Specifically, as you can see on the slide, the refined design includes buffered bike lanes from Lee Hill Drive to US 36 and an off street multi use path on the west side of Broadway. These aspects of the design were incorporated specifically to respond to feedback from community members prioritizing safety. The planning board unanimously approved the change. Um, I'm trying to be really brief. Um, so with that, if you have other questions, Natalie Stifler and I are here to answer um, any, uh, provide any additional information. Thank you so much, Jean. Council members, any questions? Uh, Aaron. Yeah, not a question, um, but just a comment, if I may. Um, Jean, thanks so much for this. Uh, very excited to see this move forward and really wanted to thank the transportation staff for being flexible in revising this project uh, based on community member concerns and council concerns. And also thanks very much to TAB for um, uh, doing a lot of legwork to help uh, refine this plan. So uh, very much looking forward to seeing this get implemented and it will be a marvelous thing for North Boulder. Okay, very good. Anyone else? Seeing none, I will say thank you, Jean, and thank you for everyone for the work that you put into this. Okay, with that, I think we are ready for a motion on the consent agenda, unless there are any other questions or comments. Bob? I move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the consent agenda, and I believe this is a roll call vote. Is that correct, Debbie? That is correct. <clears throat> Start with Count, uh, Mayor Weaver. Aye. Council Member Yates. Yes. Young. Yes. Rocket. Aye. Friend. Yes. Joseph. Yes. Nagel. Aye. Wetlick. Yes. Wallach. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Very good. And what do we have up next? Next, we have the um, first public hearing, which is a continuation of the 2021 policy statement with no additional public testimony. Great. So for this item, we have Carl Castillo, our chief policy advisor here, and I'll turn it over to Carl. Thank you, Chris, and good evening, council members and uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, as Debbie said, this is the continuation of an October 6th item. Um, the public was able to uh, provide comment on the uh, policy statement. It's the exact same policy statement that we're bringing forward tonight, with some exceptions that I will be speaking about. So the, the quick roadmap to, to this presentation is that I'm going to provide some, some highlights about policy successes that we've had over the past year. 
say a few words about why the city adopts a policy statement and how we use it, and then discuss the proposed changes to the policy statement. After that, I'm gonna ask our state lobbyists from the Headwater Strategies to say a few words about the special session that the governor just called and what we can expect in 2021. And finally, I've, I've also uh, provided some PowerPoints to capture the changes that Council Member Young has, has suggested over hotline. So I will uh, uh, turn it over to her at that point to allow her to make some comments about her proposals. So starting with the successes um, over the last 12 months, of course, you're aware that there was a significant interruption at the state house in terms of their ability to meet this, uh, this session. And there was actually an abbreviated session with new priorities that were much more important than what we had uh, originally planned for. Nonetheless, we had some significant uh, successes that I wanna to touch on. The first has to do with manufactured homes. Um, we had three things there that really helped to enhance the rights and the interests of mobile home park residents. First of all, uh, we did see the adoption of a rule that implements a law that we passed last year, which created a dispute resolution and enforcement program. We also saw a pa passage of a law that created new, new protections for residents. And then finally, we have another law that was also passed that created an opportunity to collectively purchase their park. Um, moving on, we also saw some successes on nicotine and vaping. This along with manufactured housing was a council priority looking to discourage e-cigarette and tobacco use, especially among the youth. Um, what we saw is the passage of a law that increased the age to purchase nicotine products and requires retail outlets to have a license that can be revoked if they do not comply with that increased age requirement. We also had a referred measure to the ballot on raising taxes on cigarettes and vaping devices, which was approved by the voters. Then we had the adoption of rules that created a greenhouse gas inventory, which was something that was required by a law that was passed in 2019, which we had worked on. We also saw the creation of an, of an RTD oversight uh, and practices and governance, governance committee, um, something that we had been advocating for again for over a year. Um, we were able to secure commitments for some arterial BRT priorities, uh, 33 million um, from RTD and 40 million from CDOT for State Highway 119 and 10 million for the design of State Highway 7 between Boulder and I-25. Um, then we also had the passage of a major police oversight law that really went a long way to enhance the integrity of law enforcement. And finally, but not least, we did see the abolishment of capital punishment. All of these are things that council had identified in their 2020 policy agenda um, some we played an active role, those first two ones I spoke about, and then the others we played somewhat of a role. Um, moving on, I want to speak a little bit about why the city adopts a policy statement. For, uh, the short of it is regional, state, and federal policy matters impact the city, and we have the ability to, to shape them. Uh, the adoption of a policy statement provides direction for all city officials, to speak and to advocate on the policy issues uh, and to do so in a way that is uniform and coordinated. Um, the actual advocacy or lobbying, as you, if you will, occurs, yes, it occurs by our state lobbyists and our federal lobbyists, but it occurs by all people. Um, so, you know, I, I do some work there, council members do work there. Um, and of course we have many other staff members and directors who who actually get involved in various ways in lobbying. Finally, um, it, beyond the issue of direct advocacy, um, one of the most important things that we do, because of course we are just one city, an important city, but nonetheless just one city, we do work with our intergovernmental partners and in doing so, uh, because they also are actively involved in advocacy, we're able to help shape the agenda and to work with them to achieve our goals. 
Okay, so moving on to the changes that are proposed in the policy statement. Uh, first of all, you have 66 proposed positions uh, with the changes that uh, are, are new from last year highlighted. Uh, they're highlighted in attachment A of your packet and they are also summarized in attachment B of your packet. I won't review those here uh, because there's quite a few, but I will encourage any questions if there's any, if there's any concerns about them. Um, the Intergovernmental Committee, Council's Intergovernmental Committee, uh, made up of four members, did meet to review the proposed policy statement. They met twice. Uh, they did inform the changes that you see here, including the position number 50 on healthcare. Uh, another change that was made to the format, if you will, was that we shortened the positions. We tried to aim to have no more than a paragraph um, for a description of the policy statement or of, the, of the policy positions. Uh, just, just one way to make this a little bit less overwhelming as the document is in fact um, growing. We also changed the name of it. First, last year you'll recall, we changed it from a legislative agenda to a policy agenda to reflect the fact that we're not just talking about laws and changes of laws, but we're talking about regulations and executive orders and other ways that policies can be very meaningful. This year, we're changing it to a policy statement. And what that is supposed to reflect is that an agenda suggests that everything on there is something that's going to come up in the subsequent year. That's not the case. We have a lot of things here that are there to capture council's positions and to react when opportunities arise, but not necessarily ones that we expect. What we do expect are the priorities, which are listed both the state and federal. And I wanna to touch on those here uh, next. So for 2021, we have three state policy priorities. The first one has to do with climate change and specifically advocating for all policies that are necessary to meet the targets that are identified in the state's forthcoming greenhouse gas pollution reduction roadmap. Um, and doing so while also supporting the ability of local governments to reach even more aggressive targets. Three components of this. First, we would like to make a priority of eliminating barriers to on-site renewable energy generation, uh, specifically the elimination of the 120% cap that currently exists uh, on, through, uh, on net metering. Um, secondly, we want to make sure that we evaluate options that would allow us to increase wholesale and retail energy choices. And a classic example there would be the Community Choice Energy Bill that uh, Representative Hooten uh, has carried before and we expect her to, to carry forward in 2021. And third, um, a major sector of the economy that is, um, will have to make some significant changes to decrease our greenhouse gas reductions is the oil and gas industry. And so the third priority is to really reduce the fugitive methane and, and greenhouse gas emissions that are tied to that, to, to, to the extraction of oil and gas. And we will be working very close with um, our climate coalition, CC4CA, to do this. Our second priority is transportation related. And it is focused on identify, on um, advancing the projects that have been identified in the Northwest Area Mobility Study, which is primarily a series of BRT corridors and of course, completion of the Northwest Rail. The four priorities that we want to focus on fitting under transportation for 2021. First, we wanna make sure that we secure additional funding for State Highway 119 and really protect what we've already secured of course, we know that RTD in particular is getting hit uh, significantly in terms of their revenue declines. So we wanna make sure that we protect the funding that we've already uh, got commit, committed to this project from them. Um, secondly, uh, I, I spoke about the success in creating an, over, an RTD oversight committee. Um, now our job is to make sure that we we work with that committee and we work to improve RTD governance and regional equity and the ability of RTD to partner with local governments. So we wanna make sure that we shape that. And 
Our main partner in having influence in that committee is the US 36 Mayors and Commissioners Co Coalition. Actually, now it's, it is now known as the Northwest uh, Mayors and Commissioners Coalition. Third item under transportation is the adoption of fees that would generate a sustainable and ongoing statewide and local revenue source for climate friendly transportation investments. Investments such as electrification of the transportation system. This is going to be a big discussion, both on the where the fees get assessed and then how this revenue gets used. And so we want to commit Boulder's role to working to make sure that any revenue that is raised um, is discouraging activity that furthers greenhouse gas um, emissions and that, um, any, that the revenue is used for investments that further climate, uh, uh, climate mitigation. The fourth item is requiring state and regional transportation plans to demonstrate that they are reducing greenhouse gas emissions and that those plans are consistent and on a trajectory that are necessary to achieve the emission goals that, um, that, the, that the, uh, the governor's blueprint um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, plan has identified. So that is the first two. The last, it has to do with immigration. Um, some of you may remember that early last decade in 2003 and 2006, we had um, a general assembly that passed several uh, anti-immigrant pieces of legislation that were fairly fear-based and ones that um, I don't think reflect either the values of the city nor of the current members of the General Assembly. So a priority is to repeal three of those laws, which together um, really restrict, restrict the local government's ability from proactively engaging with undocumented immigrants to meet the community needs. Um, moving on to federal policy priorities. First one has to do with getting fiscal support from the federal government for the uh, COVID impact that the city is feeling, uh, both the uh, health response as well as the, uh, the, the fiscal impact that the city is, is feeling. This is an ongoing effort that uh, the mayor has been working on for quite a while and we hope to see some advancements in January. The second one is a priority to reform FIFRA, which is the federal pesticide law, to do a variety of things, including restoring lo local government control over pesticide regulation and to ban neonicotinoids and other damaging pesticides and to close the loopholes that allow industry to bypass the pesticide registration process and to provide protections to frontline affected communities, including farm workers. This goal is reflective of a bill that was introduced by our own Congressman the Goose. We actually work with his office in the creation of it, and we'd like to continue to work with him to make sure that it is passed, perhaps not this year, most likely reintroduced in 2021. Third is our support for, the, for state, state Highway 119, and more specifically, because we do have to take these things in chunks, is the intersection of State Highway 119 and Hover. This is one that uh, the mayor, uh, our past mayor and the current mayor have gone to DC to advocate for federal funding for this intersection as an important step towards building BRT and the multimodal uh, improvements for that corridor. Uh, finally, we always have and always will have a priority uh, that focuses on making sure that we keep the federal labs funded. That's our role more importantly than anyone because the federal uh, employees are not allowed to advocate, um, as well as the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, as you know, of course, they're both heavily funded by the federal government to research in the case of the university, as well as state funds in the case of the university. So uh, this fourth priority reflects um, that need. So with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to Will Coyne and Adam Eichberg. I'll let them decide who's going to speak first. And they'll just be speaking about what to expect in this special session and in the, uh, in the 2021 session. 
Great. Thanks, Carl. Um, nice to see you all on Zoom. I'm sorry that we're not all together. Uh, I'm going to speak just a little bit about what we know about the special session, and then Will is going to talk about uh, what we anticipate for the regular session, if you call it that, or the irregular COVID session. Um, today, the governor made an announcement uh, that I think probably all of you know about at 1230, which he uh, revealed a new color on the dial and also uh, spoke, I think, at some length about a potential special session that he intends to call in the next several weeks. Our intelligence tells us that it will likely be sometime the week after Thanksgiving and that um, he will make the call, as I think probably all of you know, when the governor calls a special session, the call, as it's uh, known, both legally and colloquially, is uh, what drives what legislation can be discussed during that session. And the governor can make it as wide or as narrow as the governor chooses to do. We anticipate that the governor will make it fairly narrow to deal with COVID related relief and primarily budget COVID related, related relief. He put in in his budget submission uh, to the General Assembly on November 1st, a $1.3 billion COVID relief package that include the $375 that went to all unemployed Coloradans that has already gone out the door. And then a series of other investments uh, that he wanted the legislature to take up. They have decided that they are gonna take up that part of the relief package uh, in advance of the regular session in January. And the four things that he laid out in uh, the press conference today were small business relief in the form of direct aid and tax relief, housing and rental assistance, support for childcare providers, and expanding broadband access for students and educators. We anticipate in addition to those four buckets that some legislators uh, will uh, on their own introduce legislation that fits under the call but isn't specifically one of the governor's bills. And we could see things uh, all across the spectrum. There's nothing that prohibits them from introducing those bills. So we don't expect there'll just be four bills that deal with those four things, but more a broad uh, 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 look at those sorts of things. Um, their hope is that the session will be very, very fast, like that they can get in and out of the building in three days, which is the time it takes to pass a bill. They're talking about additional COVID protections, although um, those of us who are creatures of the legislature are skeptical about their ability to pull 100 legislators and at least that many staff people all into one space for some period of time and not have some transmission. So I think it's a good test run for the general uh, session that is supposed to start in January. And as soon as we get more information, we'll pass that along to Carl and he'll pass it along to you as far as timing. Um, Carl, are there anything that I missed or questions from council with regard to the special session? Uh, nothing for me. And uh, I, I don't know, Mayor, if you'd prefer to take, uh, ask some questions of, of Adam now, or we can always come back to him. Um, I don't see any hands raised, so let's keep going and we'll take questions at the end. Great. So I think Will's going to talk about what we anticipate uh, for the regular session. All right. I'll jump in. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So this special session that Adam's talking about will be the last hurrah for the current General Assembly. And Speaker Becker, who you all know very well, will have her last hurrah as Speaker of the State House. And in January, when they come back on the 13th, we will start the new legislature. And I think you all are um, probably follow elections pretty closely. So forgive me if I'm repeating things, but our elections here in the state for the state legislature were um, almost sort of opposite of what we saw on the federal level in, in that they were decided at you know five minutes after 7 p.m. And there was not a lot of drama and not a, a lot of unexpected outcomes. The legislature will overall stay basically the same. Um, the, partisan breakdown of the state house will be exactly the same. There'll be 41 Democrats and 24 Republicans. There were a couple of seats that flipped, but the overall makeup stayed the same. On the state Senate side, the Democrats picked up one seat. 
So they'll go to a 20 to 15 majority um, change from a 19 to 16 majority. The leadership in the state Senate will stay the same um, where President Garcia is from Pueblo and then your very own Steve Fenberg that you all know well is, um, will be the majority leader in the Senate. And then the big change for the city of Boulder will be on the House side where um, Speaker Becker is uh, stepping down for term limits and Alec Garnett, um, uh, a younger guy, younger than me, <laughs> uh, will take the helm of the state house in, um, in January. And then Denea Escar, who is from Pueblo and has been on the joint budget committee will take over as majority leader in the house. Overall, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think this is gonna change the, the overall tenor and makeup uh, of the legislature. It will generally stay the same. In terms of issues, you know, Carl just walked through the extensive list of your priorities. I think you all just listening to that can understand that there's a lot of different things that will come up in the session. Um, certainly COVID will continue to dominate the discussion. Budgetary issues related to COVID will continue to put a lot of pressure the, uh, the state took a, a big hit last spring. Um, there's been a lot of economic recovery, which you, all, which you all have seen in Boulder and have dealt with your own budgetary issues. I think the big question will be, can the, can the state's economy hold on through the winter? But that will be huge. For those of you all that have not spent a lot of time around the legislature, the other thing to know about issues is that every single legislator, all 100, gets to introduce at least five bills, whether you're in the majority or the minority. And every single one of those bills gets a hearing and a vote. So when people ask at the beginning of session, you know, what's the big thing? There are gonna be hundreds and hundreds of different issues. Um, and it's always very hard to put your finger on what's the, the biggest, hottest topic. But um, maybe to echo Adam, and then we'll quickly wrap up. I think the logistical challenges of the legislature meeting during COVID will be a, a key dynamic this year. Um, we don't know whether they're gonna gavel in and gavel back out and come back a power through right from the beginning. So um, like so much of the other stuff going on in all of our lives, it will be an unpredictable winter, but we're looking forward to continuing to work with you all and get the best results we can for the city of Boulder. Great, thank you, Will. And that concludes our presentation. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, of course, is uh, turn it over to you, uh, Mr. Mayor, but I also wanted to do two things. I guess one thing is say that the purpose of tonight's item is to conclude with a, a final policy statement that, that either we have the exact words for, or that I, at the very least that I've gotten sufficient understanding of the changes that you want to make and that you feel comfortable with me making those changes. In that regard, um, as I mentioned, Councilmember Young did have some changes that she sent to me. I took them and I integrated them into four of the city's positions, three existing and one new one. So at some point, um, as you please, uh, Mayor Weaver, I would be happy to show those on PowerPoint. And, and perhaps Mary, uh, Mary Young can speak towards him. Yeah, I think that would be good as a closing before we turn to council. So please do. Okay, great. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, can you see the PowerPoint? Let's see. Not yet, Carl. Not yet. Okay, try this again. There you go, it's coming up now. Okay, great. Um, okay, so this is the first change and um, Council Member Young, perhaps you'd like to speak towards this. Yes, I would. And um, Carl, I did add, make some additional changes that I sent you after you incorporated these. And um, I will try to incorporate them as I speak. But this one um, has to do with the um, that that has roots in the our mayor our vote uh, ballot initiative that passed this November, and um, what I want it to hopefully reflect is that um, we would be that the city would be open to other methods um, besides from um, ranked choice voting, and um, 
and ranked choice voting, that's one of the changes is to include both instant runoff voting, which I believe is was the intent of um, our mayor, our choice was the instant runoff voting, but to include both um, IRV and single transferable vote, um, as well as other alternative voting methods. Um, and so I added um, under, let me, I'm going to try and, um, wherever the RCV was mentioned, I did, um, I did include in parentheses, um, instant runoff voting and single transferable vote, to be clear, because it appears. If I could briefly interrupt you. These yes, please. Additional changes that you provided me should be incorporated here. So, oh, okay. Yes. All right. Thanks, Carl. Um, all right. Um, the main change is at the bottom, the last statement at the bottom, that basically makes um, the statement that we're open to whatever um, changes in voting methods the state sets their mind to um, make effective. So um, the main things being that they include expressive, um, that they be expressive voter intent, um, eliminate spoiler effects, provide, provide promote positive campaigning, um, improve diversity and proportional re representation, be easy and inexpensive to implement, and, um, and result in an election that is um, expressive of um, voter intent. And I think that was maybe cut off. Yes, um, it was cut off, so apologies for that. Oh, no yeah. worries. Um, but that's, um, that is um, that first change that I um, am asking council to consider. So, so can we stop there, Carl, and can you go back in your slide? Um, I, I don't mean to be argumentative, Carl, but I think that you missed a couple of what I saw in Mary's last um, email. And, and so, Mary, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. I'm just looking at the email you sent um, to Carl and I. Um, in the first line, Carl, after it says require ranked choice, Mary had put in uh, parentheses instant runoff. Um, that is true and must have had some um, addition uh, <laughs> challenges because I actually did make that change. Somehow it was not captured here, but I will make sure that that is captured. I did see your, your changes. Um, so just for the benefit of uh, council and for uh, the public. Um, oh, isn't it? Yeah, it's not quite there. So, okay. so, so, so Carl, you did get the title changed the way yeah. that Mary suggested. So that's correct. It's just the, the things she added in the body don't appear to be added in, in what you've got up there. Yeah. I believe, the, yeah, yeah, I believe the, the, the one that's missing is the one right in the first sentence where after rank choice, it, it has instant runoff in parentheses. And, and, and then another one, just to be clear, is the next time RCV shows up further down, I think it's in the, the fourth sentence, you'll see that there's necessary software for RCV. Mary had put parentheses, both instant runoff voting and multi-winner single transferable vote. And it continues and other alternative voting methods. Yep. And yep. then... I think you got the last changes in there correctly. So it's just the two, it's the first sentence after rank choice voting and then the fourth sentence after RCV. So Correct. It, great. I just wanted to make sure we're, we're all clear on that. It's an attempt to define RCV, both the term rank choice voting and the acronym a bit more broadly than just leaving it with RCV. Sorry to be confusing. Apologies. No problem. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Um, and then the next change uh, that I proposed was an additional bullet item M to, um, with the thought of what um, one of the goals that 
Carl actually brought up um, the repeal of some 2006 era um, laws that were passed to repeal laws hostile to immigrant rights and uh, repeal of federal policies because hopefully um, we will have a new president January 20th and um, repeal of federal policies that were designed to diminish the rights of immigrants, non-white people and those without proper documentation. The next one um, was due to, um, I think it was last month when we were considering passage of a uh, resolution of racism as a public health crisis. We did not have anything in the policy statement to directly support that resolution. And Carl went in and actually looked at resolution 1275 to be able for us to pass that resolution. So the attempt here is to put something in our policy statement that explicitly mentions um, dismantling of institutional and systemic racism. And um, so the change is added to a policy that was already in place. Um, and it is um, the first part of the title of the policy, which is support for policies that address and begin to dismantle institutional systemic racism that include, but are not limited to health equity, housing and wealth access and environmental pollution. And um, it was added to criminal justice reform and the justice is missing the E I just noticed. Um, and the change that is reflective of the resolution is the first um, part of the sentence, which reads in 2019, Boulder City Council adopted resolution 1275, committing the city to promote racial equity in relationships, programs, services, and policies the city will need changes in state and federal policies to help meet this goal. And then he goes on, um, goes on to um, reflect the policy that was already in place um, regarding criminal justice reform. Great. And, and go and ahead. I was just going to point out um, that we have hands up. And so I want to check in on the hands before we get too much further. I've got Aaron and Rachel. Um, Aaron. Oh, just that uh, in the one previous to this on the, the rank choice voting, I think there was a typo that I wanted to point out. Uh, can you go to the rank choice voting one, Carl, please? Um, so, well, okay, so in the um, <clears throat> the new sentence in yellow there, it says the city supports alternative voting methods and I think there's a missing word that can mm -hmm. be more expressive. Um, so if we can get that in there. And then I, I, I'm also not sure how that sentence ends. I, I guess someone got cut off and Mary wasn't sure. Yeah, what, I'll go ahead. I'll go was. ahead and yeah, I'll go ahead and read what I sent um, this, the email that I responded to Carl with in that sentence is the city supports alternative voting methods that allow for more express that allow for more express expressive methods of voter intent eliminate spoiler effects promote positive campaigning improve diversity and proportionate proportional representation be easy and inexpensive to implement result in the election of the candidate or candidates preferred by the most voters and more accurately report majority support so that's the whole of that sentence. Okay, I did, you said the part of that a few times. I didn't quite get what, what supports alternative voting methods. What, what came after that? Supports alternative methods that, that allow, allow for more, that allow for more expressive voter intent. Um, I think it's, there's an extra of there, but more expressive voter intent eliminate spoiler effects do you so want me to it, continue reading no no no. it was just that it's that allow more expressive but i that that bit of that sentence is just isn't quite making sense to okay. me and i think it's um i think it would make more sense to say the city supports alternative 
voting methods that are more expressive of voter intent. That not sounds that great. For yeah. yeah. Very good. Carl, Thank did you. you get that? I did. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Yep. And Rachel, did you have anything? I, I did, but uh, the moment passed, so I'll just hold it for discussion and questions. Okay. Very good. Okay, so I think we've got that worked out. And Mary, you had suggested the three changes. Um, I think we're clear, more clear now on, on what the first one is. The, the second two were pretty clear. Carl, did you have any other? Um, There's a fourth one. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the fourth one? The fourth one was to add a policy for um, COVID response and recovery. And um, we have been doing a lot of this and I wasn't sure where that was. Um, it, it seems like something that was needed in the policy statement um, that we have been doing, but, but was not expressly anywhere to my knowledge. So, um, and that is why I suggested this. Um, and the statement reads, um, it's number 43, support for state and federal aid for response and recovery from the COVID pandemic and the associated economic and fiscal crisis. The city supports substantial, direct and flexible emergency financial assistance to local governments and the most impacted members in their community to help address both the health challenges prevented by, presented by COVID-19 as well as the associated economic and fiscal crisis. And that, that's all four policies. Okay, I will stop sharing the screen if that is okay with you. And Carl, is that the end of your presentation? Do you wanna turn back to council? Yeah, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, very good. And Mary, just a comment on your last point. It is interesting that it didn't show up in the actual policy itself, it is the, the first of our federal policy priorities is pandemic fiscal support. So it's good that you caught that. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're ready for discussion. We've had public testimony and we've had the updates from our um, lobbyists and Carl's made the full presentation of the legislative agenda. So um, open for discussion at this point. I'm not seeing any hands. Rachel. Well, are we doing discussion or just questions at this point? And then public hearing? Or we already did public hearing. We did public hearing and questions already. Okay. So we are you can do more questions or okay. discussion at this point. I do have just um, two more questions. Um, one on issue 45, which is um, gun violence prevention, I think. Do we know uh, what the state is proposing on that or what any coming bills might be? Um, usually there are some um, routine attempts to undo legislation that uh, exists and, and um, sometimes there's also uh, legislation brought forth that is um, extending uh, gun violence prevention goals. So just wondering if, if we can be more concrete in our asks there. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Um, so position 45 is on preventing gun violence. It includes advocating for background checks, uh, storage, uh, an issue of banning assault weapons, um, providing for um, local control over gun regulations, um, advocating for a waiting period for the purchase of firearms and a minimum age, increasing the minimum age to uh, purchase and possess firearms. And it also indicates um, opposition to make my day laws um, and concealed, uh, concealed weapons. Or, or more specifically, the, the um, well, this is kind of a long um, position here, but um, it would limit the state's ability to regulate concealed weapons or local government's ability to restrict possession of weapons in public facilities. So your specific question is what's realistically likely to come up? And for that, I might turn it to uh, Will, who might know more than I do on that one. Actually, I'll, I'll take it, Carl. Will, Will's still on mute. So, um, uh, what we expect to see this year is the normal uh, attempts to repeal the magazine ban, which come every year, and I think will come every year for a long time. 
Um, there was an attempt last year to also repeal the red flag law, and we expect to see that again. So on the repeal side or the, um, the pro-gun side, that's what we would expect to see. On the gun violence prevention side, there were two bills that were in the mix last year that um, were casualties of the COVID session. One creates a lost and stolen gun registry for uh, firearms that are uh, either lost or stolen. And then uh, law enforcement has access to that, uh, that list and can identify where the guns have come from. And it helps to um, slow down the trafficking of such guns. Uh, gun shops also need to check it. And then there is a talk and a proposal of a bill requiring the safe storage of firearms um, that would require uh, current federal law requires a trigger lock be sold with every handgun in the country. The proposal, as I've seen it, would require a trigger lock or some other mechanism, uh, locking mechanism be required for all guns, long guns and handguns, and the trigger locks would now be uh, mandated to be included in the sale of long guns. There would be some sort of penalty if your firearm was used um, criminally and not stored safely. So those are the two pieces of legislation we expect to see this year. There could be others, there's talk of others, but those two are, I think are the ripest and uh, the ones we expect to see. Thanks. Um, so at least for the oppose, maybe we could add opposing repeal of red flag, red flag law, Erpo. We can certainly do that. Um, thanks for that um, explanation. And then my second question is on Mary's proposal on um, the instant runoff and ranked choice voting. It seems to me that what we need to do is to advocate for the state to um, take steps that will allow us to enact the will of our voters. So does any of that language in there um, allow the state to do something different than what our voters voted for? Because I'm just concerned that um, by making it too broad, we could lose the focus on what we actually need. So I'm not sure if that question is to Carl or the lobbyists, but can you do something so broad that you backfire and then don't get what you actually need for your city? So thank you, Councilmember Friend. That, that's a great question. I believe that the changes that uh, Councilmember Young has proposed are not problematic. They clearly indicate that we need um, direction from the state to allow the county to uh, engage, use ranked choice voting. It, it indicates that we would support additional methods of alternative voting. Um, so I guess how this might play out is, should there be a bill and in fact, we already know that there was a bill that may be introduced on this very issue. Um, and should it advocate for just ranked choice voting? My understanding is we would support that. We would attempt to get it, to make it broader to include other methods of alternative voting, but not to the point that we would endanger its passage of the core part of it, which we know that we need by um, 2023. So that is uh, my read of how this position uh, would, would be uh, used. And so I don't see it as problematic to make it more expensive, expansive. Okay. Could we, um, could we modify it to at least say like, above all, we want ranked choice voting and instant runoff or whatever the proper language is there so that we, you know, like 80% of the voters, I think, voted in favor of that. So like make it clear that it's, it's not a, an either or, but like that's the top thing that we want. And then the other stuff is great in addition, but we don't want the state to, you know, just do something that uh, makes voting more um, more representative. Like we want that exact thing that was voted in and then the rest is fine too. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Well, first, I, I certainly would read it that way, but you certainly can make changes if council would, uh, would like to. I, I can certainly revise this to clarify that first and foremost, we, we need the authority to conduct elections with ranked choice voting. And then we would also like alternative voting methods. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary, but um, certainly can be done if that's something you'd like to propose. All right, uh, consider that proposed to the fellow council members. And then is this, should I uh, go ahead and get into my other discussion topics, Sam, since we've done, go through my little list here. You're on, Rachel, go through your list. Great, um, okay, so on number 37, which I'm sure we don't all have memorized. 
Um, the issue is on um, fund and protect the municipal uh, justice system's ability to combat homelessness. Um, and there's a clause in there at the end that says we uh, oppose legislation that would diminish local control and authority to um, govern homelessness or address homelessness in the manner best suited for community needs. And I have a problem with that, putting aside the um, camping ban, which I imagine is the hot potato issue that, that is the reason that we want that in there. I actually would prefer that the state take some action on homelessness to sort of um, make it something like minimum wage so that wherever you are in the state that you are unhoused, you are um, going to receive some services. So I don't understand. And it also, you know, there's sort of a, a narrative in Boulder that if we do things too well, um, people will come from all over the state to receive our services. So I would actually rather see or have us advocate to the state um, to improve homelessness services and um, that goes against local control. So I'm, I'm opposed to that clause in 37. Um, and then the last thing is just maybe a general comment and a request for the committee members to sort of look holistically at, at the balance of, our, um, of what we advocate for. So as an example, um, we have like one paragraph on criminal justice. And I think that just got um, bifurcated by Mary's edition, um, which I don't, I'm not opposed to, but that's like all there is on criminal justice. And then we've got like the first several pages on um, energy issues. So I'm not sure the history or how we got here, but it seems lopsided towards certain issues. And I don't know that they, they represent um, the, the most dire needs of our community. And so just would ask that maybe the committee consider looking again, holistically at how much um, time and energy we are spending advocating for some things and not others. And, and some of those things have huge impacts on our community members. That's what I got, thanks. Very cool. So I have one concrete proposal and one issue to take back to the committee. Is that fair? That sounds fair. Um, let me pull up my notes again. So, so, sure. so I'll, I'll try and repeat it just to make sure I captured it so we can talk about it. You have the issue with ranked choice voting and I'll come back to that with a comment later. You have the issue with opposing section 37 and you had some portion of section 37. I wasn't quite sure what that was, but, and then you talked about having the committee go back and look at balance. Yep, that sounds right. Thanks. Okay, so there's two tonight that could be talked about. That sounds accurate, well done. Okay. Thanks. Mary? Yeah, um, thank you, Sam. Um, I just wanted to provide a little bit of history on um, the policy statement that I just bifurcated. Um, that was actually a statement that I had requested um, a couple of years ago. Before that, there was nothing on criminal justice reform. So I bifurcated my own policy that I had suggested a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'm glad that you suggested it and I'm not opposed to the bifurcation. I'm just using it as an example of like, I think that whole section, you know, should receive a lot more attention. And so, um, you know, I'd be in favor of you, you know, the first part getting its own section too, but also just looking, um, having the committee look deeply at like, why, why, why isn't there more balance in the set in the sections. Okay, Mary, did you have anything else? Um, no, that was all. Okay, so as far as I can tell, um, we have pretty good agreement throughout most of this and I'll dive into the details in a moment. I wanna step back and thank the committee for having worked through this with Carl. And I wanna say, Carl, I've seen lots of versions of this and I think this is probably the cleanest and easiest to read and follow of all that we've had so far. So thanks for, I know you've kind of revamped this and made lots of edits and we're, we're seeing the final version here, but I wanna thank you for all the work you put into this policy agenda. Um, it is a great document for us to carry forward. It always gets revised. Um, I, I do just wanna thank both the committee and Carl for all the work that's gone into it and to our lobbyists for their input as well. So, um, I've got two items outstanding. I'd ask 
does council want to raise anything besides the ranked choice voting and then Rachel's point on um, opposing part or all of uh, policy 37? I'm looking for hands or wave at me or whatever. Okay, so let's start one, uh, one at a time. Um, let's go with the ranked choice voting. I have comments, but I would be happy to hear if anyone else has responses to what Rachel put out there as far as Adam, then Bob. Thanks, Sam, and thanks for the suggestion, Rachel. Um, I tend to agree. I want to make sure that at minimum we can provide what the people ask for and everything else is secondary to that. Not that I wouldn't like to see other ways of voting being explored. I think that will be important in the future as well. So I like, I like having that whole statement, um, but I kind of agree. It's 1A and 1B. Kind of to me. Okay, very good. Hang on one moment. I'm just rereading it. Um, after Adam, we've got Bob and then Aaron and then Junie. Bob? We, um, Carl, would you mind putting the language back up um, so we could look at it? Um, Bob, I'm happy to do that. In fact, I should mention I do have the ability to share my screen. What I can do is pull up the actual policy statement and that might be the cleanest way if that's okay with you. Okay, let me go ahead and do that. So I'll start talking while Carl's doing that. I actually, um, I actually like what Mary's written. I, I keep in mind that the, the three people that we're really writing this little love note to are all on on the call with us right now. It's it's Adam, Will, and, and Carl, right? And they're the ones that carry forward the will of council. And I think they've heard loud and clear that they that we want to make sure that we get the um, ranked choice voting uh, uh, enabling legislation that. Um, helps what our voters approved in the, um, in the fall election. And then secondarily, if, if a more broad bill can be advocated for, then that's just icing on the cake. So I, I'm not sure that we really need to wordsmith this anymore since I think the p three people who really need to understand our intentions um, just hurt us pretty clearly. Uh, I mean, if we wanna wordsmith it some more in case Carl or Will or Adam forget what we talked about tonight, I suppose we could do that, but I, I'm actually pretty happy with Mary's language. You, Bob, then we've got Aaron and Junie. Yeah, I'm, I'm more where um, Rachel and Adam are that, I, 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 Mary, I appreciate you adding in the uh, support of the other uh, alternative voting methods. I think those should be in there, but I'd prefer language that says, number one, uh, please uh, enable this uh, uh, ballot measure that our citizens just passed, our residents just passed. And then number two, uh, please, while you're at it, also uh, explore other alternative um, voting methods, uh, e including uh, Mary's great language there in that last sentence. Junie? I am, I understand what Adam is saying, but I am actually okay with the comments or the changes by Mary because of um, what Carl said. Um, he mentioned that it is unnecessary. So therefore I'm not so sure why, because I think as council members or as regular people who, I'm not sure how many of us has, have drafted these, you know, these legislations or legislative policies. And I think if the person who's the drafter, who knows how it's done best said that it is unnecessary, I am, I, I would be willing to side with him and just go with what he said. So, and if it's not really gonna make any difference, I think we are just, I'm not so sure why we're going down that path. So I'm willing to leave it as is and just, just go with what Mary said, because it doesn't seem like there is any substantive changes that it will add up by parsing the changes or making those changes. Thank you, Jenny. I have no other hands, so I'll weigh in here. I'm also pretty happy with what um, Mary has drafted and what Carl says is good. Um, you know, ranked choice voting is a catch-all um, bucket. It has lots of things which go under it. And so Mary's 
addition of instant runoff in the first sentence, and then instant runoff as the first thing clarifying um, ranked choice voting RCV in the fourth sentence, I think put the um, single seat instant runoff voting first, which is what our voters approved, even though it probably wasn't called that, um, that's what it was. Um, and then the multi-winner single transferable vote, which is the thing which would enable more people um, and, and promotes diversity and so on, is listed second. So in both cases, what the voters approved is listed first. So I'll, in short, I'm where Junie and Bob and Mary are, and I'd just go ahead with um, what Mary's proposed and Carl says is probably sufficient. Okay, so I, if we need to, we can take a vote on it. Um, it. It seems to me like we've got a, a close split. I count three, Adam, Rachel, and Aaron, who would like to wordsmith further. I got a few of us who wouldn't want to wordsmith further. So why don't we just do this, a quick straw poll. Raise your hand physically so I can see it, if you would like to, to change what Mary suggested. I got one, two, three. Okay, and everyone who would like to leave it the way Mary has drafted it, uh, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Okay, so we'll leave it as it is. Thank you, Carl. And then Rachel, the next item that I have is discussion and resolution on section 37. So would you like to, to say again, specifically yeah. what you're interested in? Sure. If I, before we move on, Sam, could I make just one small comment regarding the, um, the statement on, um, on voting methods? And the reason I, one of the reasons I included this was because um, of one of the statements in the last sentence, which is easy and inexpensive to implement. Um, as, as you all recall, our county clerk said that um, it would cost about $300,000 just to get the software um, license to be able to conduct that um, voting method that was suggested in the ballot initiative if it is not done by the county and the city would have to do it. So that's $300,000 just for the software license and not including any um, personnel or other expenses. So I just wanted to make, you know, given the situation that we're in right now economically, I just wanted to make sure that if necessary, um, the city would not have to undergo that expenditure. That's hey. all I have. Very good. Uh, if that closes out the voting question, then I think we're on to um, section 37. So Rachel. Okay, so section 37 says fund and protect the municipal justice system's ability to combat homelessness. And the tail end of it says um, city supports state legislation that funds and facilitates homelessness, um, combating homelessness efforts. At the same time, the city opposes legislation that would diminish its local control and authority to address homelessness in the manner best suited for community needs, including prohibitions on local governments banning camping in public spaces. Uh, so my concern there is, again, that I'm, well, broadly my concern is that we want to help the members of our community and our state who are most vulnerable, um, and that includes people who are unhoused. So. Um, we get a lot of pushback, um, and there is you know, at least a theory that if you um, provide extra services, people will come to your city because they're not receiving good homelessness services in their own city. So from my perspective, it would actually be better if the state um, did require cities to have a, a baseline of services. Um, for example, some cities have in their charters that they may not have homeless shelters. And that's, that's not actually good for Boulder when they don't do that, because then um, you may want to come to Boulder for shelter. And it's good that we have that, but I think it's better if people who are unhoused can get services where they are. So I don't think it's to Boulder's benefit to um, say, to advocate against the state for you know some um, efforts the state was um, making to try and improve services for people who are unhoused. I think that um, I'd rather see us advocate for better services for people who are vulnerable and in, in, 
in need of state services and in need of um, services with their, their own um, municipalities. So I, I can understand um, there's a lot of uh, divisiveness in the community about the camping ban. So even if we wanted to leave that clause in, I think it would be preferable to limit it to that clause and not um, tie our hands on, on advocating for improvements um, at the state level. Does that make sense? Uh, I would turn to you and ask for a specific proposal. The things you want to strike or the words you want to add, is there? Um, I would, so personally, I would strike the last sentence. I imagine that people, if anybody's interested in even considering this, would want to leave in or modify it to just um, city opposes legislation that would limit local controls ability to ban camping in public spaces. So one of those two alternatives, um, but I don't think that we should, that the, uh, the entire middle clause just um, broadly limiting local control, I don't favor. And I don't think it helps our community. Okay, so I think I have Aaron, Junie, and Bob, but I'm not sure if any of these are leftovers. So, so it looks like some are leftovers. So <laughs> Aaron, do you wanna comment on Rachel's point? It, it was a leftover, but I also want to comment. So I'll take okay, the opportunity. I figured, I Thanks, figured as much. Um, can we, um, so I'll come back to you, but I'll just make a sure. quick comment. Um, can we get the hands lowered? Very good. Okay. And so Aaron, go for it. And then Bob. Uh, yeah, Rachel, thanks for bringing this up. I, I've uh, I've disagreed with that as well. Every time it's come up, when it has actually come up, I would think my uh, when I'd been on council for just a few weeks, this came up, and I was opposed to that um, as it's written. So I would support one of uh, one of those two as well. That um, that there could be interventions from the state level that would take away local control in ways that would benefit us and benefit the state and benefit uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness. Okay, Bob. Well, I, I disagree. Um, this the, the clauses like this appear throughout this policy statement. We, there's probably, Carl, I don't know, six or ten or twelve of them throughout, uh, and um, I think pretty pretty consistently in the Colorado Municipal League, pretty consistently resists um, state legislation that diminishes local control on any number of topics. Um, and so I, 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 I'm not sure I understand why striking that would be a good thing. So if if there was a bill that um, limited our local control on homelessness, we would be in favor of it or we neutral on it. I mean, what would, what would we want to do with that? I think we need to take a position as we have on any types of limitations of local control. So I would keep it in. Great. Then I've got Adam and Junie. Adam. Yeah. I don't know where this should go or how to put it, but I, completely agree with the idea that the state should have the ability to sort of create a minimum standard for every city to abide by when it comes to dealing with issues of homelessness. And that may be an entire different clause or something along those lines. The camping ban is, is there in the ideal world so that people like anyone on council won't just go to the park and camp. It's not necessarily for people who are experiencing homelessness, that that rule is in place, in my mind, at least. So I don't know if we send this back to the committee or what, but I get exactly what Rachel is going for. I don't think striking this is necessarily the way to hit it. But yeah, coming up with a statewide minimum of service, I think is a policy, policy stance that most of us would probably agree on. Thank you, Adam. Junie and then Mark. I do agree with Rachel on mechanism that would allow us or help us to better serve our homeless population. But I do understand the importance of local control. It doesn't just serve one purpose, it's multi-purpose. So I'm wondering, because I'm looking at the yellow section and I'm wondering for Rachel, is it for me when I read it, the part that is most troubling is the part that says, including prohibition on local government banning campaign on public spaces. I wonder if we could put a period after needs and just remove that section, would Bob be okay with it? 
would Rachel be okay with it as opposed to removing the whole thing? Because I think the local control part is important, I think. But just the prohibition on local government been in camp and I just think that extra is not needed. Does that so, make sense? Yeah, if that, if that was a question to me, um, I, so just, you know, this whole section is just specific to homelessness. And so I'm not suggesting that we eliminate local control throughout this document, but as specific to homelessness and our goals for helping our community members and feeling like our hands are tied um, because, you know, by people who don't want to provide really good services because they think people are going to flock to our city as a result of that, I think that the answer is not us providing less services, but other towns providing more. And the language in here saying, specifically, we oppose legislation that would diminish local control means that we can't do what, like Adam just said, he supports, which is a statewide effort on specific to homelessness, some, some minimum baseline services. So that clause in there, city opposing legislation that diminishes local control as to combating homelessness is really the piece that I'm concerned about. Like, I think it, I actually want to advocate the other way. Um, and, and I talked to state lawmakers about that. Like I want the state to, to, um, to do things that will make life easier for people in their own communities. And so this actually goes against what I do personally advocate for um, at the state and federal level. So I, I guess I just don't know why we would want that clause in there that ties our hands as a city outside the camping van. Junie, is that, are you done or do you wanna respond? No, I mean, I've made my point as to where I thought the, ch the changes could be made and where the challenges are for me. And I mean, I understand where Rachel is coming from as, as well. Great, uh, Mark Qualick. Yeah, I don't know that there's a necessary disconnect uh, between uh, advocating for some minimum standards on a statewide basis for the provision of homeless services and still permitting um, local control of how those services are provided in the context of those minimum standards. And I would be happy to uh, include language that is receptive to uh, establishing a you know, minimum state standards for providing homeless services uh, while still uh, retaining language that permits us to chart our course in the manner we think best. So to, I guess I'm agreeing with Adam um, that this may not be the sentence or the place to put that language in, but I would be receptive to adding some such language to the document. Great, and I'll weigh in here. There's no more hands up. Um, I'm not interested in changing the sentence that's here now. I think it's here for a reason and it's important to be here. However, I do hear what Rachel's saying and I would say that we send it back to the committee to try and come up with um, the other policy that goes along with this and then clarify this language referencing that other policy that says we do support minimum state standards um, within whatever parameters we wanna put on it. I think generally speaking that these kind of changes need to be put forward earlier so we can read them and think about them. It's hard to hard to wordsmith on the fly. And so I'm not interested in changing what's there because I think what's there um, is here because um, we, we do want the ability to, in particular, um, have bans on camping in public spaces and we'd like to have local control on how we manage the challenge of homelessness in Boulder because there's unique needs here. But I do agree that it would be great to have state minimums for um, you know, homeless services that are being provided. I just don't think we're gonna get there tonight very easily. And if we do, it will be cobbled together. But I would support sending it back to the committee with a recommendation to make sure Carl will take a note to come back to this and try and address the issue of state minimums for services that are provided while still allowing um, the justice system to uh, make the rules that we need to. So that's and, where I'm at. May I colloquy out with you on that? Sure, please. I, 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 I would have to agree that, that doing this on the fly is not the best way to proceed. 
and we ought to send it back to the committee uh, and, and you know, deal with this in a more systematic uh, manner. I'll call it way that works for me. Okay. Okay, very good. Well, that sounds like consensus to me. So I believe that we'll leave it the way it is. And Carl, you took a note that at our next um, legislative committee meeting, we'll, we'll address um, how to parse out support for state um, mandates for homeless services and maintaining our ability to um, have our own justice system approach. Yep, I got that. Okay, super. So with that, are there any other issues? Final call for points to have a conversation about. Great, seeing none, I think we're ready for a motion. Uh, Aaron, I see your hand. Yeah, I was um, actually gonna make a comment, just that I wanted to respond to the folks in, in open comment who were advocating for the council support of the improved Medicare for all. And just wanted to acknowledge um, uh, their efforts and their advocacy and say that I think that under our uh, new um, healthcare policy as it's written, that uh, that we would uh, support the, the, the city would support an improved Medicare for all bill uh, if it comes to the floor, uh, we just also left that language uh, to be open and more broad uh, because, you know, with the state of the federal government right now, uh, we very much hope that there will be progress on health care, uh, making it cheaper, available to more people, ideally universal, but the reality of the federal government right now is that the next steps are likely to be incremental. So um, we uh, want to make sure that we would be out there supporting um, any bill that came forward that would improve health care for our residents in the country as a whole. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Well said. Anyone else? Okay. I think, again, we're ready for a motion if somebody would like to put one on the table. Raise your hand. We have lots of leftovers, so I will look for a hand wave. Aaron. Since I sort of have the floor, um, I'll move that uh, we approve the 2021 policy statement on regional, state, and federal issues um, as amended by uh, the changes that uh, Mary suggests and were, were posted um, on the screen earlier. Carl, does that capture? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Um, Debbie, is this a show of hands? Yes. Okay. Very good. I will ask, is there anyone opposed to the motion? Very good. The motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thanks a bunch, Carl. And thank Will, Adam, for being here. And thanks to the committee again for your work getting this up for us. What's next, Debbie? Um, we have their second public hearing tonight is the continued second reading and consideration of a motion to adopt ordinance 8431 designating the building and a portion of the property at 1770 13th Street as an individual landmark. Thank you, Council. Uh, here to present uh, this item again is Marcy Cameron, a historic preservation planner from MBS. Take it away, Marcy. All right, thanks so much. And Taylor, could you pop the slides up on the screen? Excellent, thank you. Um, good evening, Council. Um, this is the continued second hearing for the designation of the Tea House. Next slide. The criteria for your decision tonight is found in 911 and 9112 of the Boulder Revised Code. And that's, will the designation protect a building or site reminiscent of significant eras, events, or people from Boulder's past? Or does it provide a significant example of architectural styles from the past? And then will the designation maintain an appropriate setting for the building and site? Next slide. The options in front of you tonight are to approve the designation by ordinance, modify and approve the, um, the ordinance or disapprove the designation. Next slide. Um, kind of a check-in on the process. Um, it came to you in first reading back at the beginning of October, and then the second reading was October 20th. We left that meeting with direction from you all to um, add language to the designation ordinance to protect the interior of the building as well as the exterior. 
And if approved tonight, um, we'll come back to you on December 1st on the consent agenda for third reading. Next slide. Just to make sure we're all talking about the same tea house, it's the one at 1770 13th Street um, near the band shell in the atrium in the east um, bookend. Next slide. So since October 20th, um, staff has met with the applicants, the friends of the tea house, it, as well as Lenny Martinelli, who is the operator of the restaurant to come up with um, language that protects the interior, but also does not impede the operation of the restaurant. And we were able to um, come to that language in agreement, uh, which is what's in front of you here tonight. Next slide. So I would just like to pause and say thank you so much to both Lenny and the Friends of the Tea House for working together to find a resolution and um, just briefly going over what the approach and changes are in the ordinance. We first state why the protection of the interior uh, features is justified in this case. It's a city owned building that's open to the public and the building was originally designed as an open air pavilion. Second, it clarifies that the regulated portion of the building is limited to the pavilion portion of the tea house and does not include the utilitarian part, which is the kitchen, the bathrooms, the hallway and the office. And then it outlines the review process for the interior. And our approach was to fit it into our existing design review process rather than creating something new um, just for this case. And then finally in the um, section that describes the significance, we added the significant interior features as well. Next slide. We also added this um, floor plan, which is meant to show the difference between the utilitarian uh, addition, which is the hatched portion, and then the pavilion portion on the left. Next slide. So this um, is the proposed landmark boundary, which um, encompasses a portion of the um, property, and the proposed name is the Boulder Duchamp BT House. And next slide. All right, and with that, staff and the Landmarks Board recommend that the City Council adopt this ordinance and designate the building and a portion of the property at 1770 13th Street to be known as the Boulder Duchamp Tea House as an individual landmark. And I'm um, happy to answer any questions that you might have. It looks like you're muted, Sam. Yeah. Thanks for you, Marcy. Thanks to you, Marcy, and apologies for my meeting. Um, I just wanted to point out for um, those watching that we have had a public hearing on this um, issue already. And so we will not be having further public hearing tonight. So I turn to council. Uh, if there are any questions, um, we'll start with those first. I see hands up. I see Junie and Aaron's hand up, but I think those are old. So um, Sarah, could somebody put the hands down so we can start fresh? Yeah. And I see Aaron's hand up. Aaron, is that current? It is not. Okay. I see. All no hands are cleared. <laughs> okay, very good. I see no hands up here. Uh, Bob. Uh, if there's no questions, I was just going to make a motion. I think that's appropriate. Marcy, can you put the motion language back up? Oh, Taylor, could you do that? a little different than what was in the memo, so I thought I'd read it from what you wrote. Mm -hmm. So I move that we adopt Ordinance 8431 designating the building and a portion of the property at 1770 13th Street, including portions of the interior, to be known as the Boulder de Chambay Tea House as an individual landmark under the City of Boulder Historic Preservation Ordinance. That's as amended in the packet, Bob as amended in the packet, thank you. You're passing on second reading at this point. Yes. Thank you. I heard the second, who is that? Me. Okay, very good. We got a motion by Bob and a second by Mark. Any discussion? I just wanna thank um, staff um, for finding a way to protect their interior. It was important to our community. It was important to council. I know it's unprecedented. Um, 
and we may never face a situation where we uh, need to look at the interior of a building. But in this case, because the building, the interior of the building is so special, probably as, as precious as the exterior, and the fact that it's a city owned building, uh, I think um, warrants the um, uh, unprecedented uh, protection of the interior. So I really wanna thank staff for its flexibility, for listening to the community and for listening to council. Thank you, Bob. Mark, anything? Uh, no, I, I agree with everything that Bob said. I think this is a, an appropriate and a perfect outcome. I do wanna thank staff and the city attorney office for crafting this language. I think it is carefully crafted. I think it achieves the purpose. Uh, and as Bob said, to, to a great extent, this is a one-off, um, but this is the perfect one-off um, for interior designation. Uh, it may never come up again, but this is the building that should be protected. And I'm delighted that we will have the opportunity to do so tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. And I'll just say, you know, this building is a treasure for Boulder. Um, it, I think is one of the few, if not the only building of its type in the Western hemisphere. And so we're very lucky to have it here. A lot of history behind how it got here and the difficulty in finding a home and then the wonderful amenity it's turned out to be um, and will be for a long time to come. So I wanna thank our Landmark staff, uh, Landmark's board and all the citizen input we had on that. Marcy, I see your hand up. Yes, I forgot to mention in my presentation that the applicant is here tonight in case council wanted um, to uh, uh, ask any questions or, or provide time. Um, Carl Anuda is here on behalf of the applicants. I, I think it's worth having Carl say a few words if Carl would like to, especially since he's here. Carl? Uh, I'm not actually seeing Carl in the meeting at the moment. Okay, then maybe not. We'll hear from Carl. Aaron? Well, I was actually just about to raise my hand to thank Carl and the uh, friends, the Boulder Duchamp Bay Tea House, uh, for bringing this forward and for uh, their work with the uh, landmark staff um, and the, the uh, um, operators of the restaurant there. Uh, you know, this may be my favorite building in Boulder. It is a community treasure, so I'm looking forward to voting here in a minute. Great. Well, thank you, Aaron. And I see no other hands up, so I think we're ready for a vote. Debbie, is this show of hands? Yes. Okay, very good. So I'll ask it in the negative. I'm sorry, it's a roll call. My it's apologies. a roll call. Okay, very good. <laughs> and it's a show of hands. It's, you're, you're amending on second reading. You'll, you'll pass it finally on third. Okay. Show of, show of hands. Show of hands. All right. Okay. So I will ask this in the negative. Is there anyone who is opposed to um, the motion. Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you to everyone again. This is great. Thank you, Council. Okie dokie. Uh, what is next, Debbie? Okay. We're up to matters from the city manager, and tonight we have the CU South annexation and engagement update. Thanks, Council. Yes, the one item for uh, matters tonight is an update on CU South annexation and engagement. And here to kick the item off is Phil Kleisler, a senior planner from Planning and Development Services. Good evening. Thank you very much for your time, Phil Kleisler, Planning and Development Services. Uh, thanks for pulling up that, that presentation, Sarah. Appreciate it. And so this is a um, check-in with council around some community engagement that we're planning for the next several months for the CU South project. Uh, what's proposed this evening is a fairly brief staff presentation by myself and Jean Gatza around um, just kind of teeing up some of the materials uh, found in your packet, followed by a five minute presentation by the University of Colorado Boulder, specifically um, Derek Silva, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Business Strategy specifically on how they plan to plug into the engagement process. And then lastly, for the remainder of the agenda item, about 45 minutes um, will really be reserved for council discussion and input on next steps for the project. And so a slide, please. The two questions we have for council this evening are, are fairly basic and it's really around if council members have input on the draft briefing book that was included in your packet this evening and then second, we have been working uh, with Mayor Weaver and Council Member Friend on the process subcommittee. Uh, it's been very helpful and we've developed a community engagement strategy that we'd like uh, for Council to weigh in on. 
And so next slide, please. A little bit on the background, um, as council members know, there's quite a bit of background. And so we could spend a long time on this, but um, just briefly for the folks watching in particular at home, uh, we do have an active annexation application uh, for this property owned by the University of Colorado Boulder. This application is, is pretty unique for Boulder uh, for a few reasons, one of which is the size. And so at just over 300 acres, it is the largest um, generally undeveloped site in the Boulder Valley that is eligible for annexation into the city of Boulder. Another unique um, circumstance with this particular application is uh, that there is no site plan. <clears throat> and so the university is several, um, really several years away um, from developing a, a site plan for the site. However, um, there is significant flooding events that have been taking place in the area. Um, and as a result, the city has expeditiously been um, seeking to implement a flood mitigation project for the site. My apologies. The flood mitigation project um, does require um, several acres of land um, that only becomes available if and when the city annexes the entire site uh, and thus allows the university um, to connect to city utilities um, and plan for future development on the site. So next slide, please. This is the review process that we anticipate for the annexation application. Um, so council members has, have seen this before. Um, we completed the first row of this particular process with council selection of the flood mitigation project in June of this year. We've also visited with the planning board uh, last month, um, sharing these materials for some input ahead of this discussion. Uh, and that input is uh, included in the council memo this evening. We're now, um, uh, you can click the slide once, um, visiting with council to really preview the engagement materials prior to setting out and facilitating a community dialogue. All of that information will then be summarized to city council in 2021. And it's at that point that council um, will see where the community, how the community feels about the proposal and direct staff on, on generally a path forward for the annexation. And it's at that point where we would draft the legal agreements for the annexation, the annexation agreement. And we would go through the more typical process found in the third row of this particular process um, where the planning board holds a public hearing to recommend uh, approval or denial or approval with conditions to the city council who then holds first and second reading. Uh, slide please. The anticipated schedule for the flood mitigation projects really stretches pretty far beyond the annexation or at least what's anticipated currently for the annexation um, with uh, really con finishing construction um, by 2026. Um, however, there are um, several dates that we just wanted to flag for council that are, are fairly immediate. One of which is the Open Space Board of Trustees tomorrow night will be hearing from staff on some analysis we've been doing on an upstream detention concept. And so the board will hear um, staff presentation and, and ask some clarifying questions tomorrow night. Uh, the planning board will receive an update on that analysis on December 3rd. Um, and then the Open Space Board of Trustees will then reconvene in December um, to hold a public hearing and um, deliberate on um, a recommendation to council. All that information will be provided to council in early January. Uh, slide please. And so the, the first issue that we had um, teed up for council this evening is really around a, a briefing book concept. And I, I guess the thought behind this, um, it's a fairly recent document that is still probably pretty in a kind of an early stage, but we've been facilitating this negotiation largely through a term sheet that's attached to that document. That term sheet has been really the back and forth between staff and a lot of the items um, have evolved and may not be relevant and frankly could even be contributing to some of the dis some of the misinformation or, or misconceptions that folks had on the site. And so we recognize that and on October 5th, the university um, submitted um, a response to the annexation application and we just created this as just another communication tool um, just to be transparent about where we are in this negotiation um, and it, really to update it as we learn more throughout this public process. Slide, please. The several components of the briefing book, just to highlight the term sheet itself has, each topic has a specific number. And so what we've done, um, the color-coded table on the left just shows kind of what's the term sheet topic, 
um, the actual topic itself, a summary, and then some indication around the staff alignment, sort of an executive summary of all the topics in one place um, that you can get through pretty quickly. Each of those topics are then summarized in greater detail in the chapters of the book. And each of them include um, a summary of what's the policy guidance, uh, particularly from the comprehensive plan, what's the proposal, and then whether or not staff is aligned. And then as we go through this public process, the idea is to then start at least putting some bubble diagrams on a map to start showing where um, different things might take place on the site in lieu of not having a site plan for the site. Uh, slide, please. And um, one more slide prior to handing it over to Jean to talk a bit about our, our plan for engagement. We wanted to just um, give an indication about sort of where we are on the timeline, the longer term timeline of this project. So looking back at the 2016-2017, um, we had a pretty big community conversation through the comprehensive plan update uh, that ultimately resulted in um, guiding principles for the site adopted in 2017. And as part of that, sort of everything was on the table and we talked about the vision for the site. And for an example, the vision, one of the vision uh, statements is around view corridor protection. So in early 2019, the university submitted an application for annexation that attempted to take a first pass at translating those into annexation terms. And so we've been using that term sheet for the last year and a half uh, to really bring ideas to the surface. And you know, some of them have surfaced, some of them have not. We're in agreement with a lot, but there are still other things to work out. Could you click the slide once? And we're now at the point of, it's really been a staff to staff conversation between the city and the university. And so we feel that these topics where we're at right now, it's really primed for the community to weigh in and give us an indication about whether or not, whether or not we're heading in the right direction. And so one more click on that slide. And it's then once we start to get a sense about where we are or are not heading in the right direction, um, staff would then be writing the more detailed fine grained terms found in an annexation agreement. That slide please. And I'd like to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Jean Gatza, um, our planner and engagement specialist. Um, thank you, Jean. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'm really um, happy to be, be able to be here tonight to share the full engagement strategy and get your feedback. Um, the purposes of this engagement of the engagement strategy for this window are to inform and consult about how the potential terms of the annexation will meet those guiding principles that were outlined in the comprehensive plan. We've, in, we've designed this engagement strategy to provide transparent and easy to understand information and materials. I really appreciate the comments from um, several of the uh, speakers tonight during open comment around the ease of the briefing book. And also um, we, we really wanna make sure that um, we address this prevalence of misinformation or just incomplete information um, and really appreciate that support for the um, briefing book that we'll continue to use as an important tool um, moving forward. We will be hosting multiple venues and opportunities for staff, CU, and decision makers to hear interests, concerns, um, ideas, and to listen together. Next slide, please. The strategy is designed to help people understand where we are in this process. At this stage, as, as Phil described, we are refining these concepts and terms. The briefing book um, will be designed to very clearly, or it is designed to very clearly outline those guardrails. And then when we get to the questions that we'll be asking um, on Be Heard Boulder and in the questionnaire, um, they will be designed to go deepest in those areas where we are not yet fully aligned and where there's the most opportunity to shape the terms. Next slide, please. We are so very thankful to have the process committee and the monthly meetings and the very thoughtful guidance from Sam and Rachel and all of the dedicated community members who attend those meetings and help us shape the strategy. As I mentioned, multiple venues will be designed to accommodate a range of preferences and purposes. These will all be virtual formats to keep people safe and allow them to both get information and to provide feedback um, at their convenience. We're also aiming to ensure that folks can participate regardless of their technical or Wi-Fi capabilities. We recognize that this is such a really complex process with many topics. The planning board provided some great feedback um, to help us structure this 
process to um, to to let people effectively engage on the topics that they are most interested in. Uh, they called it called call it a bit of a choose your own adventure, um, and we just want to make sure that we're we're um, being able being able to make sure that folks can do that and not have to wade through all of the information just to get to the things that they want to really weigh in on. Our venues that we're planning will include um, providing a lot of information on the project website, as well as the Be Heard Boulder online platform. This will include um, hosting the briefing book, the question and answer tool, a questionnaire and um, other relevant uh, tools that we'll get started on later this month. There'll be a com community briefing that will be recorded and include the overview of key topics, where to find information, how to utilize the tools, and how to ask questions and get more information. There will be a discussion forum, um, kind of a world cafe style virtual meeting with breakout rooms on key topics. The purpose for that is for participants, participants to be able to discuss ideas and to hear from each other. Um, we'll try to design it as much as we can, as, um, as we would if we were in person to be around tables together. And then we're also hosting um, staff office hours, so some smaller virtual group meetings um, to allow people to ask questions and to um, share feedback in that way. We're scheduling these at various times and various days, the first couple weeks of December. We also have, um, we're planning on some neighborhood meetings. We have one of those scheduled already and we'll be looking for um, some help from council members or community members to help us identify those um, neighborhood groups who might be um, open to hosting staff and um, others to come and uh, have a meeting and discuss some of these issues and ideas. Next slide, oh, um, one, more, one more point. There will be a part two. Um, we recognize that transportation will be a really important issue for folks to weigh in on. And we anticipate that there'll be more information on the transportation analysis in late January. And so we'll be designing additional, um, designing and hosting additional sessions with that focus. So next slide, please. Our, our aim is to really ensure that the engagement provides community members the right level of information and ways to provide um, and ways that they can provide their feedback, but also that the feedback is really helpful to you as decision makers as the annexation ne negotiation proceeds. The strategy will be successful if it serves both of those purposes. And so we would love to hear your feedback on if this is heading in the right direction. Um, but before you dig into that, um, we would like to turn it over to Derek Silver from, uh, Silva, pardon me, Derek, um, from CU. Hello, Council, and thank you for this opportunity to speak about uh, our participation and engagement and also for just a brief update on where we are with the annexation process. And I have a, a slide deck uh, filled. Is someone going to bring that up? Or PDF? Yeah. Has that been submitted previously, or do I need to make you a co host, Derek, so you can present? If you make me a co host, I can present if it's not there. Oh, there Actually, it, it looks That's like it. it's coming up now. All right. Oh, would you mind clicking on the view button and going to full screen? full screen button up top, middle, middle, go over to the right, the middle, you got to see the X at the top, the very, very top of the window. <laughs> if, actually, if you go to view, next where it says file edit view, you can click on full screen, it'll, it'll get rid of the um, kind of view. Stuff. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. Okay, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? All right, so uh, just to give an update on the current status, as Phil had mentioned earlier, uh, we submitted our updated application on October 5th. Uh, and that is in the format that we've had, which is that spreadsheet that's tracking the different comments uh, back and forth between the city and CU. Uh, <clears throat> we're currently work working on developing a design guideline supplement to the application 
And the intent on that is to provide more detail on different provisions that really lack clarity and definition in the guiding principles. Um, some of those things are how would height limit be measured? Um, uh, what is the definition of a clustered village style development? That sort of thing. It'll be pretty detailed. Um, we're, we need to vet that with our CU leadership uh, before we do release that because it will, uh, what we put in there will be somewhat binding to us in the future uh, because it will be memorialized in an, in an annexation agreement. Uh, and we anticipate delivery of that guideline supplement in mid-December. Uh, we're also working on converting the application term sheet, which is in that spreadsheet format, to a narrative format. And the reason being is if you, if by tracking it through that spreadsheet, it's very difficult to see what the cumulative agreement is. And so by putting in that narrative format, we'll um, be able to capture what that cumulative status of each top topic is. And that'll serve as a more functional negotiating instrument in the future uh, so that we can use that to redline and track changes as we uh, negotiate to the final agreement on the different topics. Uh, we anticipate the completion of that uh, effort in mid-January, and we share that with the city and, and as well gets comments back from staff uh, on the different provisions to make sure that we're all in agreement on what we're in agreement on. And then uh, the transportation study is underway. We anticipate that will be delivered in uh, mid to late February, and that's what will help to inform that second engagement, um, uh, the second engagement effort. So Derek, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, what you said was <clears throat> you expected transportation mid to late February. What's on the slide is mid to late January. I'm sorry, you're right, mid to late January. Okay, great, just checking in, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Uh, slide, please. Uh, so in, in regards to annexation engagement, um, we plan on participating in each engagement event and task that's scheduled. Um, and we'd love to be, uh, you know, robust participants in that. I mean, we have an interest in what happens out there and certainly we hold uh, the answers to all the questions that the community will have. So uh, we envision being a valuable part of that process. Um, in addition, we're already connecting with different uh, community stakeholders. Uh, for instance, Parks and Rec, we had a conversation with them last week on their desire for uh, certain parks um, uh, playgrounds, uh, a running track, and some other in a dog park, and some other things around the site uh, that we are currently uh, working on evaluating. And it, certainly, we would love to see uh, public access remain out there and uh, provide amenities out there that will draw the public and to make it a really activated and um, uh, and and really beneficial development and to integrate with the community in a in a very uh, very uh, meaningful way. Uh, we've also, uh, in talking to BVSD, we've had discussions with them previously on some of their needs out there and the shared for, say, recreational fields for lacrosse, soccer, those sorts of things. Um, and I think the running track, they may have an interest in that as well. And then other relevant community interest groups. Uh, we've, uh, I know we've had discussions with people representing the disc golf community, mountain biking community, and that sort of thing out there to see what uh, sort of uh, amenities could be preserved out there for those uses. And we also, uh, just around the engagement topics, I mean, our desire is for it to have a really positive focus on what the community would like to see out there. Uh, again, we'd love to have this, uh, this site be integrated into the community in a way that would um, draw a really, a, the, a really positive opinion from the community about what's happening out there. We I mean, know there's been a lot of contention about what could happen out there and um, from our lack of being able to commit to a specific development plan out there but we really do see this as being a, a, a great addition to the community in Boulder. And uh, the transportation and open space engagement window is to occur in that second engagement window. Uh, that'll be once we have that transportation study in mid to late January. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just a state, it's, I found some parts of the guiding principles that really uh, speak to engagement. I mean. The, public participation part, which is principle, general principle number three, talks about the city and CU working together to include the community and public effectively throughout the planning, annexation, and development process. And we certainly see the engagement process that's proposed as, as meeting that criteria. Uh, and it's it also speaks about the negotiations of the annexation agreement and using the guiding principles um, and that the guiding principles are intended to really inform that intergovernmental agreement that will be the annexation agreement between the parties. Uh, slide, please. And then ongoing efforts that we're engaged in. Uh, so we're obtaining appraisals of the OSO designated land. 
obtaining an appraisal and assessment of Dry Creek number two. We're actually uh, doing a master plan of all our water rights, but specifically that for the valuation and assessment of uh, the future use, potential future uses of Dry Creek number two water rights. And then uh, just ongoing updates and vetting of the offer components with campus leadership uh, as we proceed through negotiations. So uh, any material changes that we make to what we have on the table, uh, we have to go back to campus leadership and uh, if they arise to a certain level of magnitude back to the Board of Regents. Next slide, please. And so that's uh, my brief presentation. Uh, so open to any questions as well. Um, I think that uh, that Gene and Phil had some questions or we're going to take questions on the briefing book and that sort of thing, which uh, we'd also like to comment that we think the briefing book is a very, very good distillation of some very complex concepts that are very hard to understand and bring some clarity and certainly so a view into where we uh, are currently in this stage of negotiations. And thank you. Thank You're you. good. Thank you. That concludes um, both the presentations for council. Um, and so there may be clarifying questions um, or you may uh, want to kind of dive, dive right into the, the questions that we posed for council. The first of which being if you have input around the briefing book. Yeah, and thank you so much um, to Phil and Jean and, and Derek for your input here. And uh, I'll talk more about the briefing book. Could you put up the slide with the questions on it just so we have them in front of us? And while staff is doing that, I'll turn back to council. I see one hand, this would be a great time for questions and then we'll go into a conversation about the feedback to staff. So Adam, see your hand. Thanks, Sam. And thank you for the presentation. Um, I did have a question regarding the, the Board of Regents. What type of things tend to actually get up to them as far as level of questions, especially given that there's a new Board of Regents and uh, you know the, the makeup kind of changed there? What is, what is their general feedback or you know what, what do they end up making decisions on as far as this process goes? It would be anything that's... Um, and it, that's material in addition to what we've already offered on the table. I mean, I think we believe our offer is a good offer and um, we certainly don't think there's gonna be a need to go back for really substantive changes to what we've offered. I think there's some, some room around the margins, but if there were a, some big component that had a material, say financial impact or development impact on what we've anticipated to date and what we briefed them on today, uh, we certainly have to go back to them and as well, um, certainly for the final uh, approval of any land conveyance, uh, the regents approve any conveyances of uh, a real property interest. And so those would have to go back for formal approval from the Board of Regents for that disposition. Thanks for that, Derek. That yeah. answers my question. Very good. I've got Aaron and Rachel. Aaron? Yeah, so just to uh, so I understand the scope of what we're talking about tonight. Um, when you, you say, when you ask what input we have on the briefing book, you're not asking us to weigh in on the substance of all the different uh, term sheet items, right? It's really more about the, how it's laid out, what it's trying to address, that kind of thing. Is that right? I believe that is the, uh, yeah, that's the intent. We're really focusing on process engagement. Is it clear? Is it missing something? For example, the planning board, uh, recognize that we need to add a financial analysis section. There should be uh, some additional summaries about how to use it and so on. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you, Aaron, Rachel, and then Mary and Mark. Um, yep, thanks, Phil and Derek, for the presentations. Um, one thing that Darren, Derek said um, about meeting with like mountain bikers and BBSD and, and um, some comments we had about pedestrian access and crossings. Um, I just wanted to know, along with the transportation studies, does the transportation advisory board weigh in on this at all? Or how will our um, resident advisory experts um, give us feedback? Right now, they're not scheduled to weigh in on, on, on that. And I do think there is some, Tom may need a weigh in, but a charter provision that does, I think, require council to make an official ask of TAB to weigh in on something like this. But um, it's something that we could look at, certainly. 
So um, thanks for that. Uh, because one of the big things, right, is, is that it's a multimodal transportation hub in our um, in our guiding principles, as I recall. So I guess maybe I'll just tee that up for later discussion to see if we want to invite Tab. Thanks. Great. And next I have Mary and Mark. Mary? Thank you all for the great presentation. And I love that briefing book. Um, so my question is likely for Derek. And um, in the memo, we had uh, just a bullet item that said that the university is pre preparing high level design guidelines. And could you just elaborate a little bit on what is contained or would be contained within those design guidelines? I sure can. Uh, so how we've envisioned it is that we view the guiding principles as encapsulating the, the framework that we are answering to. It has a pretty extensive um, points addressing different aspects of the development. Uh, height limitation is one. Um, a, a clustered village design, I mentioned those two earlier. Um, other ones are uh, incorporation of green spaces. Uh, the, the Whether there will be any large buildings out there, what those would be defined as. All of those things in the guiding principles, or many of them, do not contain, they contain sort of general con conceptual statements about what the development standard should be, but there's not a lot of definition or methodology there. And so with the design guidelines, we're trying to identify each one of those and add more detailed methodology, that sort of thing, so that you can look at them and say, you know, not have questions about what the defined terms mean, about what we're, how we're going to achieve different things. Uh, I think an example is on the height limit, we've agreed to a height limit of 55 feet per the city ordinance and um, or the city charter. And we have, um, uh, we've actually incorporated the city's methodology for measuring that. So we're being clear on that. We're, the guiding principles were very silent on that. They, as a matter of fact, the guiding principles said, uh, speak to something of uh, in substantive conformance with the city's height limit. And so we've gone a step further and said, We'll meet the city's height limit and we'll actually measure it like the city does and so in, in any place where we can bring that clarity to that uh, i think it gives uh, you all more certainty as to the specific standards that will apply to future development on the site and that's what really what we're trying to achieve thank you derek have you um in the process of establishing design guidelines have you considered um putting a little more definition to like clustered village design, say for example, and um, perhaps providing um, some illustrations of what that might look like, maybe even going so far as to providing form-based code. Um, have you considered any of that? Um, not the form-based code part, but the other two illustrations and, um, and more definition around that. I mean, the cluster village design, that, I think that's one that stood out to pretty much everyone asking, what does that mean? Uh, so that's exactly what we're trying to achieve is to at least offer something on the table is that this is what we think it means. And we've actually worked with city staff on many of these. And so the, the height ceiling concept that Bill has proposed and that's um, shown in his briefing book, that's one that we've actually worked together on to try and establish and decide. And it actually solved a few problems on the site. It solved not only uh, the height measurement on the site, but it also solves part of the transitioning of the heights as you move to the west toward the uh, boundary with the uh, adjoining neighborhoods on the left. And so there's, we're trying to find ways to, you know, if we can uh, kind of kill more than one bird with a stone, then let's do that. But um, in that height ceiling concept actually solves a few problems, but also uh, impacts view sheds as well. So there's uh, different things that were not only within the guiding principles, but finding new concepts to apply to kind of uh, uh, tie the guiding principles together so that they work, work together as, as we believe they were intended. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Mary. Next we have Mark and then Rachel. Mark. Okay. Um, with respect to the first question input on the uh, draft annexation briefing book, I think it is an enormously uh, useful instrument. I thank you very much for putting that together. Uh, it's, it's tremendously helpful to see uh, on a project with as much history as this one has, uh, the chronology of issues and how positions have evolved. Um, so this, is, this makes 
life so much easier for anyone who is attempting to understand where we are, where we've been, and, and hopefully where we're going on this uh, project. Um, and with respect to the proposed strategy for community engagement, uh, I would only encourage you to um, seek out the various uh, groups within the neighboring communities and the affected communities, uh, uh, whether it's HOAs or neighborhood associations and hold special meetings with each of them so that uh, they can be well briefed on what's going on and, and what uh, uh, and how this project is proceeding. And uh, that's all I've got, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next, Rachel, and then Aaron. Rachel. Um, sorry if this is already answered, but um, Mary made a point that made me um, think of another question when she asked about uh, see you doing illustrations. Um, and not that long ago, we had a presentation on East um, Boulder subcommittee or our subcommunity planning rather, and there was like a 3D modeling instrument, have we thought about using that for, I know we don't know exactly what's going to go at CU South, but some renderings that would help us to visualize what options could look like there. And I hope I'm using the right terminology with 3D modeling. If anybody else remembers what I'm talking about, feel free to chime in. As, as staff, we tossed around the idea towards the beginning a little, um, and we were pretty hesitant because I think once you see a box there with like no windows and it's sitting there on the site, it's a little um, unappealing and maybe doesn't tell the story of what actually will happen there in the future. And so we we had a brief conversation just as staff and, and opted not to do that. But um, Derek may have any any additional thoughts on it, but um, not a, not at this point. We, we really focused on kind of the height ceiling as, as being one of those components. All right, I'll reserve the rest for discussion. Thanks. Uh, Aaron. Uh, yeah, well, I, I heard um, Mark uh, addressing the questions. So can we move into discussion? Uh, sure, absolutely. If uh, no one else is, so I'll, I'll dive in after after Mark and agree uh, generally with what he said. The, I mean, the briefing book is extremely well put together. Uh, you know, somebody who's followed this project closely for a long time, I found it to be very helpful. And I, I know community members will as well. So uh, big hats off and kudos uh, for putting that together. Um, I, I think your engagement strategy is is on target. And I also um, trust in the process subcommittee, uh, Rachel and Sam, to keep that um, on target as well. So thanks for that. One thing I would say is, um, you know, like a couple of people in open comment mentioned about some uh, you know, misinformation or incorrect information that's out there um, sometimes in the community. And so the briefing book is a great factual thing to put out there that people can refer to for here, wh what are the facts? Here are the facts, here's the briefing book. But you uh, might be helpful to like on the website somewhere to do something like a frequently asked questions that, that both had uh, answers to questions that, that are just like, well, that, that just have the facts out there, but also maybe uh, have answers some questions about like, well, is this thing happening that I've heard might happen? And the answer is no, whatever that, that, that thing you heard that might happen is not actually gonna happen. So, you know, we might be able to address some of those, um, uh, some of those misunderstandings out there with, with some additional information that, that we could put out as part of the engagement strategy, just to make sure we all um, have all the facts on hand. And then I, I wanted to piggyback on, on Rachel's thing and maybe, maybe Rachel going beat you the punch here, uh, but uh, I appreciated uh, her bringing up the tab in, in this, the Transportation Advisory Board. It seems like um, that once uh, we've gotten some more progress on what the transportation connections and numbers look like or might look like, that um, getting some input from tab on um, you know, how we might uh, address those in the potential annexation agreement um, could be valuable feedback um, for us and the community. So I, I think that's a great idea. And that's it. Thank you, Aaron. Rachel. Thanks for letting me double dip again. Um, so I, I would, t um, I guess, want to ask that if we need to have a vote on inviting tab that we um, see if we have uh, support for that tonight. Um, because again, I think that this is such an important transportation hub that it would be um, silly not to in invite them to the conversation. So that's one thing. 
Um, and I agree with everyone's comments about how wonderful um, the briefing book is. It was outstanding work. And like Aaron and the rest of you, as somebody who's followed along with this project for a while, it's um, it's really nice to see. And I um, on on Peter Vital, I think giving um, the idea for a myth busting section. I like that, and I would love like a PDF where we could um, respond to some emails that get some. You know, there's. Sometimes there's like a stream of, of emails that have um, misinformation in them. And if there was a, a ready document that council members or staff could respond like um, saying thanks and, and um, this might, you know, you might be interested in this too or something like that because um, I think it is important that, that we all operate from a, a set of shared facts. Um, and then last on my 3D modeling question, I think, um, it's good to be transparent and to help people visualize what's going there. I understand um, that a, a box or a marshmallow looking building can be frightening to people, but I think um, at least having some renderings or something that that helps us to see, you know, how there, there was some in the in the briefing book that shows like what the what the road would look like with the wall, but there's not much really showing what it might look like when it's you know part of it's built out and and how the open space would connect with the rest of open space and I assume have like a, a fence between and things like that. So I think it would be helpful if we can um, alleviate some fears or um, or just help people to visualize. So I would, I would love to see some more um, artwork around it. Thanks. Adam. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I wanted to speak to engagement primarily. Um, you know, this is one of those like we started out in the presentation, it's one of the biggest projects we've ever done. So um, annexation is not a bell we can unring. And so having that engagement process that is really getting every single you know person's input in, I think the, the worst thing we can do is feel like somebody's been unheard. So um, access to all the comments access to everything that is said in meetings uh, to the best of staff's ability, obviously, um, so that council can see it and make decisions based on that full community input, I think is probably the biggest thing that I'm concerned about simply because I don't want anyone to feel like, hey, council didn't see my comment or didn't have access to my comment and then made a decision sort of without my input. Um, and I think you have a pretty comprehensive plan um, I just want to make sure that, you know, there's probably people who want a, a survey option of saying, I don't agree with any of this or, you know, things along those lines. Um, I don't want any stone to be unturned when it comes to what somebody might want to say um, in response to this, because again, I think our top priority is making sure we hear every member of the community and their thoughts and then making a decision based off of everyone being heard. Is that all, Adam? That's that's uh, my little diatribe. Mm, good. Okay, so I don't see any other hands up, so I'll jump in here. Um, I will tag on to all of the other compliments on the annexation briefing book. Uh, we also said that in the process subcommittee meeting. It is a really great document that crystallizes a lot of issues and it further crystallizes you know, where we stand as far as agreement or disagreement. So I think it's very helpful and I think it will need to be updated as we come into agreement. So one small suggestion would be to have a version or date that goes with it because I expect we'll see it, you know, as we get closer and closer, hopefully the reds turn to yellows and the yellows turn to green. So that would be something to be thinking about. So the only input I have is it's great. It will be a living document and we need to think ahead about how it's going to live. Um, and, and then on the engagement strategy, you know, Rachel and I have had a lot to, to say about this. Um, you know, we kind of in the process subcommittee kicked this off in a way because we wanted to get community members input as early as possible. So as soon as we got the, the input from CU, the response from CU, we figured it was refined enough to be wanting to take out to the community. So it will perhaps lengthen the cycle a bit on the annexation, but it will get those comments that Adam was referring to in earlier rather than later. 
Another comment about soliciting community engagement is there's a very small possibility that nothing will happen on this property, but that's an extremely small possibility. Much more likely is that something will happen. We'll have flood control and there will be some kind of construction. Um, so I, I guess the Adam, I agree with you. People should feel free to say we want nothing here and keep it as it is. But then the follow on question needs to be, well, if something were to go in there, what would you want to see A around flood protection and B around built environment? So I think we we do want to um, you know, put the reality out there that there's a high likelihood something's gonna happen. And if something happens, we also do want to hear the input of of what that could and should look like. Um, and then, you know, I, I will say again, some of the buckets that I put out there, I think staff probably has this, but for the engagement strategy, some of the key points that I think we want to look at are access, like access points and who can go and where and when. Um, transportation, that has a ton of pieces to it, right? So TAB, I think we want TAB to weigh in. I think we want TAB to weigh in um, both early and late. And so early, there are questions like, how many access points will there be? You know, historically, <clears throat> access from 93 has been off the table, but the reason why it's been off the table is gone now. We aren't gonna have a Jefferson Parkway or Northwest Parkway. And so given that, um, wouldn't it be uh, useful to have access there? So, or, or transportation access there, so there's, some big picture questions, and then there's some questions that get down to things like hubs under transportation, built form, built environment. Um, I think that's really important. We've touched on it. I really do appreciate the ceiling concept as well. I will say, Rachel, as a caution, that it is having gone through Alpine Balsam, putting out massing studies that don't have some kind of decorations on them or something will, will create um, a talking point that we're going to build Soviet block architecture out there. So I think we just want to be really careful. If we are going to do renderings, they need to be kind of the pretty pictures we get at concept plan, where they're street level looking at buildings that are kind of sketched in. So I'll just put out there, let's not fall into the trap of doing massing studies um, if we're not going to do them in a way that's going to make them look appealing. Then the uses, you know, I think that question will come up and people will, will have input into that. We know some things that are off limits, but, um, you know, what's going to be on limits? Well, we have housing, right? We have a lot of um, desire for that. But as the university gets more clear on things they want to preserve as options, I think we want to hear from the community about that. And then Rachel alluded to this open space, not only what's going to be open space, like what does the university intend roughly to keep undeveloped um, or to develop for fields, but how is it going to connect to our open space? So there's the open space that's there, there's the open space that we will probably get as mitigation for any habitat um, impingement from the flood wall. But how are those connections going to be made and issues like how will wildlife move through? You know, what will the relationship be between the natural world, which is just over there, and the buildings, which are just over here? So, so that's just kind of a long-winded way to say, I think in the engagement, we're going to want to break it down into the buckets. I think Gene alluded to that with choose your own adventure. So I appreciate that. I just wanted to touch on, on those particular points. And then I have an extremely minor question that I just want to get clear on. Um, I had thought as we looked at the open space hearings that we were going to divide it up into two parts. The first part, staff presentation and public input, and the second part, mostly deliberations. It sounds like it's moved in a different direction, which would have public input be in the second meeting. And I, I would just say, probably too late, but to the extent that there could be a way to get public input at the first meeting, my concern would be if you're gonna have two, three, four hours of public testimony, having that on the same night as a long deliberation could be, could be difficult. Um, I guess the only other thing here is the myths and the myth busting. You know, I think FAQs are great and they're important. 
I think some things that some people consider to be misinformation or incorrect information actually boil down to differences of opinion. So if we are going to do myth busting or um, fact sheets or whatever, I think we need to be really clear that they're facts. And I think the briefing book did a really great job of that. So um, when you're trying to do myth busting, you really have to be careful um, where's the opinion line and where is it really just about facts? So I think that's all I've got to say. I want to compliment staff again. Staff has been, NCU, um, have been really um, engaged and I think we're going to continue to be engaged with the community as we work through what Adam correctly called one of the biggest, you know, annexation and development projects we've ever looked at. So that's all I've got. Aaron, I see your hand. It, not to jump ahead of anybody else, but um, you know, Rachel, I appreciate your intention with the the three D uh, modeling. But I, I agree with Sam on the um, this from experience that that when when you put that out there, um, it can it's not necessarily representative of what's going on, particularly since we don't uh, we're not going to have any kind of site plan from CU. So uh, I think it, it could give people incorrect impressions um, that might be um, make them feel that something's going to happen that that's not necessarily going to happen. And like you say, the, the block style Soviet architecture. So, you know, maybe some sketches, uh, but it, it might be better to keep it in numbers and words. Great. Okay. So <clears throat> I see no hands up at the moment. So I will check in one more time. Any other input? Seeing now, and I'll turn to staff and say, staff, did you get what you were hoping for from us? Do you have any other questions for council? This has been super helpful. Really appreciate you taking the time on your agenda to, to talk about this. Um, the only other piece is that I, the language around the tab um, question is that the board shall not involve itself in any review under the, under the land use regulation title nine, unless it's opinion is requested by the city council. And so what opinion means, I might need to defer to Tom or, or to Chris on that, but um, that's the general, that's just the language um, that I found entitled to. Tom's on now. If you don't mind me just weighing in briefly as having been on the planning board, Title IX is mostly focused, I believe, on site plan review. And this is much more concept and, and annexation, and we'll let Tom weigh in. I think it's legislative. So I don't know, Tom, Tom, do you think there's any reason we can't involve TAB and input into an annexation? I would recommend that you make the request that uh, the annexation provisions are in Title IX. So uh -huh. broadly, the way that language is written broadly, since it seems to be consensus on council, it probably wouldn't hurt if you just voted to ask for their opinion on the subjects that you addressed earlier, Sam. Okay, very good. Um, so I guess we'll bookmark that and, and come back to that and have a vote right at the end. Um, so anything else by staff nope. that we need to weigh in on? No, thank okay. you very much. So I think uh, just to formalize what Tom suggested, um, would someone like to make a motion requesting TAB to weigh in on the CU South project? Aaron? Uh, I'll move that we ask uh, the Transportation Advisory Board to weigh in on the um, CU South annexation project. Second. Okay, and I'll ask this in the negative. Is there anyone opposed? I see none, so I think it's unanimous on the part of council that we would like TAB to be involved in the input to the transportation aspects of the CU South project. Okay, very yeah, good. Add, um, I, I wanna thank staff on while we're complimenting the subcommittee. It's been a pleasure to work with you on it, but also Jean um, and the rest of staff have done a really great job of shepherding this uh, subcommittee and annexation and the mitigation uh, side as well. So a big thank you to staff overall on this project. Yep, as well as Joe and um, Joe Tadeucci and <clears throat> Dan from Open Space, Dan Burke. So we've had a whole cast of characters helping with the process of committee. And as Rachel said, they're all doing a great job. So thank you. 
Okay, so that will close out that item. And I think that will bring us to, um, Debbie, I, I think we moved to matters from mayor, is that correct? Yes, matters from the mayor and members of council. And the first um, item is the consideration of a motion to select a mayor pro temp. Great, and I would turn to Bob Yates. Thanks, um, I would uh, like to make a motion that we elect Junie Joseph as the, um, our next mayor pro tem. I'll speak to the motion when you're ready, Sam. Great, is there a second? Second. Very good, so um, Bob moved, Aaron seconded, Bob? Well, first I think it's, it's important for us to remember the background, uh, the, the term of the position of the mayor pro tem is um, for one year from each November to November. And for many years, um, going back to even when the role was called the deputy mayor, it's been the tradition of this council to rotate the position of mayor pro tem each November to a council member who has not yet served in the role. Um, it's been my honor to serve um, council as mayor pro tem for this past 12 months. Um, it's been a year that has tried our community, um, our city staff and our council. Uh, none of us could have known last November what 2020 would bring us but we have per persevered with the grit, the determination, uh, creativity, and the grace that characterizes Boulder. When we have faced challenges, we overcame them. And when circumstances tried to drive us apart, we came together. As much of an, uh, as it has been an honor for me to serve as mayor pro tem during the last year, it is my even greater honor to nominate my colleague and my friend, Junie Joseph, to serve as our next mayor pro tem. The two principal responsibilities of mayor pro tem are to serve on council's agenda committee and to step in as acting mayor when the mayor is unavailable. Therefore, the position requires the willingness to work hard and the capacity for fairness. As we have all seen during Junie's first year on council, she possesses both of these attributes. From her leadership on the financial strategy committee to her collaboration on the intergovernmental affairs committee to her sense of equity on the police master plan and racial equity committees, Junie has proven herself to be hardworking and fair. On council, she is always a good listener. And when Junie speaks, she is deliberate, balanced, and most importantly, kind. For all these reasons and many more, I urge my council colleagues to elect by acclamation our mayor pro tem for the next year, Junie Joseph. Thank you, Bob. Aaron, would you like to speak to it since you seconded? Yeah, well, I can't uh, top those eloquent words of Bob. Thanks for that, uh, Bob. Um, but just want to say, uh, Junie, I'm very grateful to you for putting your name forward. Um, I think the city will benefit from your leadership. And uh, I look, uh, look forward to seeing the amazing work that you do for our community over the next year. Thank you, Aaron. Adam? Uh, just want to ensure as a matter of process, there's no one signed up for public comment on this. Well, we're going to or have discussion. That Okay. We have Perfect. discussions, and then at the end of, of matters, we're going to open a public hearing. So we're not going to vote until after the public hearing. So um, we make our comments now, move on through the matters agenda, and then we'll have a public hearing and a vote. Awesome. Just wanted to clarify. And uh, as far as discussion goes, I couldn't think of anyone better to serve as mayor pro tem uh, than Junie. So looking forward to the, the vote once we get to it. Very good, Mary. Did you say Mary? Mary, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, I thought you said Aaron, sorry. Um, well, Bob said it really well, but the two things that stood out for me in um, what Bob said was Junie's sense of fairness and kindness. And I think it's something that we can all aspire to. And, um, and I have certainly been learning a lot from Junie in those aspects. So um, thank you. And I look forward to um, your service, Junie. Great. And Mark. Okay. Um, you know, serving on council, we don't get too many easy decisions to make. Uh, so I'm pleased that uh, this one is easy. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to Junie's service, and I'm looking forward to uh, voting to elect her as mayor pro tem. Easy call. Very good. And no other hand, so I'll jump in here briefly. I want to start with a big thank you to Bob. 
Um, I can't tell you how the roles of the mayor and the mayor pro tem have changed with COVID. Um, and because there were lots of things that were unexpected, things that were unforeseen, issues that came up that were not part of the normal um, role of council really. I use Bob a lot to bounce things off of and to you know, develop ideas for how to go forward with the issues that we were having to kind of face on the fly and invent um, how we're gonna work with staff and our community, how we're gonna communicate, just as you all know, cause you've had to go through the same decision-making. Um, I, I bounced many things off Bob and he was very supportive as I tried to feel my way along um, and stepping in for times when I couldn't make it. So I, I just want all of us to thank Bob for the enormous amount of work that he did as mayor pro tem more than most mayor pro tems have been asked to do in the past. So thank you, Bob. And, you know, Junie, I look forward to working with you. We'll hear from the public hearing before we finalize it, but I will tell you, um, I think it's a great nomination and thank you for um, putting yourself forward to do this work. If there are no other comments, we'll move on to the next item, which is a uh, consideration of our 2021 proposed council meeting calendar. Do we have anything from staff on this? Um, no, I, I provided you with the updated um, the updated calendar in your packet, and it was with the changes that you requested, um, giving you the week of July fourth off, but extending your June meeting one your June meetings one more week into the month. So, very good. Thank you much, Aaron. I just wanted to thank you, Debbie, for being responsive to my request. So appreciate that. No worries. Any questions from council, comments, feedback? Great, seeing none, um, we'll just keep moving through. Uh, the next item is the retreat discussion. I'm sorry, so, Sam, I just want to, on the calendar, I have my hand up, but I- um, Oh, sorry, I didn't see no it, worries. apologies. I think there's a couple of questions that staff had for us about the calendar we should probably answer. One is they wanted to know, uh, what well, first I just want to call everyone's attention to the fact that there would be two weeks off at the end of March, which I have zero problem with. Um, but the staff did ask the question for March 23rd, whether um, since CU has canceled spring break, does council wish to add a meeting that week? I would say no, but we should probably answer that question. And the second question that staff asked us on the calendar was we, whether we were okay adding uh, November 30th as a council meeting, normally we would have it off because it was a fifth Tuesday, but uh, staff recognized the fact that um, there would, there's only two meetings in, De in December, the way the calendar is set up. So I think those two questions we should ask, uh, answer November 30th and March, uh, I think it was 23rd. Great, and for November 30th, I believe we're making a decision for the next council. So I'd say yes to that one. <laughs> <laughs> So I agree, um, Bob, that was just a joke. So let's start with the uh, um, March 24th. Bob made a suggestion, which is that we don't do a meeting. Does anyone have any objection to Bob's suggestion? Adam. I would just say if we have anything come up, you know, as we do on occasion where we need extra meetings that we keep that one in the back of our head um, as potential. That's great, that's good feedback. Okay, so seeing no other comments, we'll bookmark the 23rd as a possibility for meeting if we need it, and then move on to November 30th. I think there are two questions. One is to cancel CAC on November 1st because the next day is election day. Um, I would say that's a no-brainer that we cancel it. Anyone wanna have CAC on November 1st? Okay. Very good. And then do we want to add a council meeting um, on the 30th? So it, it's a little interesting. We have a study session on the 9th, which would have mayor and mayor pro tem speeches, not at a council meeting. So I want to turn to Tom briefly and say, do you think it's okay that we have the pro tem and speeches um, scheduled for Tuesday of the 9th? So 
Sorry, Tom, that was a question for you, just to make sure, do we need to have those speeches at an actual council meeting? And Sam, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, I just wanna just quickly read the rules. Okay. Okay. So we'll take a break on that. We'll come back to it. That's just to make sure that we've got everything lined up on the schedule for the speeches correctly. Um, and then the question of a council meeting on the 30th, which would be the second council meeting of the new council. Um, I guess my thought is that's a good idea. Uh, Mary has her hand raised. Yeah, just a quick question on um, the March. The twin, it was the 23rd is off for spring break and the proposal is to keep the 30th in our back pocket in case we need it. Is that the, 20, the 23rd in our back pocket in case we need it? Okay. Right, Adam. I'm just, I thought that's what Adam was suggesting. That's correct. Cancel it as of now, but in case there is something that comes up in the next three months that needs more immediate attention, just have that as a potential that we may meet. So, so Mary, I think what we're canceling on March 23rd is a study session. Um, well, the, the calendar on our, in our packet says no meeting on the 23rd and no meeting on the 30th of March. That's correct. Um, so yeah. And, and my only concern is that it makes it difficult to plan. Um, if you're going to keep it open and then, so I'm just, that's all. It makes it difficult to plan. So we either decide to do it or not do it. Um, so that folks can plan. I think the defaults not do it. I think it would need to be an emergency kind of situation to, to bring it back. It, you know, there, we weren't going to take a spring break there because, or at least not an official one, I don't think, because we normally tie ours in to CUs. So, um, it, Mary, would you like to just take it off the table, even as a possibility in the future? Is that what you're lobbying for? I think that's what I'm lobbying for. Okay. Um, of course, if yeah, that's what I'm lobbying for. My intent was only to ever have it there as an emergency meeting as well. So I think we're talking the same language. Okay, so we're canceling it and CAC is advised, please don't put anything there unless all council gets consulted first. Is that fair, Mary? Okay. Good Thank enough. you. Sam, I've reviewed the rules. It is okay to have the speeches at a study session on the ninth. Okay, super good. So then the, we, we've agreed on no CAC on Monday. And so the question is, do we want to have a council meeting on the 30th? So it'd be a second council meeting for the month. Um, Adam, you've still got your hand up. Is that on this? That's the new one, yep. Um, as a recent addition, I think having more meetings is way better than less. Um, for new members. And I think we'll have several new members next time. So um, I would I would vote yes, even though it's a decision for the next council, but <laughs> well, I strongly advise that they do it. <laughs> Are there any objections to saying yes, that we're gonna have a meeting on November 30th, 2021? Okay, I don't see any objections. So I think we've answered all the questions. Thanks, Bob, for the reminder on that. Um, I think we cleared everything up. So let's take a look at what comes next. And then, oops. In the retreat discussion. Retreat discussion, yep. Bob, is that you? Who's gonna lead that one? It's gonna be Mary and me both, and Mary's gonna start us off. Once I unmute myself, um, all right. So, um, so our retreat is scheduled for um, January the 22nd um, from four to eight in the evening and on January the 23rd from eight to 12 in the morning. And it's going to be over Zoom and it'll be broadcast on Channel 8 and YouTube 
and Heather Bergman is going to serve as our facilitator as usual. Um, but we will start off the whole celebration on um, with our pre-retreat study session on January 12th. And at that meeting is going to be when we um, hear from our boards and commissions and review the final agenda for the retreat. So the boards and commissions um, have each already been asked to write a letter to council and nominate a member to present their letters at the January 12th study session. So each group, each commissioner board is gonna be given three to four minutes to summarize their letter with two to three minutes for possible questions from council. And there's been one board that is already decided to prepare a short video in lieu of a live presentation. Bob, you wanna take it from here? I will, thanks. Um, one other thing that we might do, um, or at least talk about briefly at that um, um, study session on the 12th, uh, um, if council members want to change their committee assignments, and, and we, uh, for those who are new to council, we typically don't make a whole lot of changes at, at midterm. But if someone has a burning desire to swap with a council colleague and they can work that out between themselves, um, we can talk about that briefly at the meeting on the 12th, maybe after the boards and commissions present to us. Um, again, was, this is not a wholesale, of, everything's up for grabs arrangement, but if somebody wants to add something and has, has found somebody who's willing to give it up or, or wants to swap some assignments, I just suggest that people just talk about that offline over the next few weeks. And on the 12th of, Jan of um, January, we'll hear if there's any changes, but um, in, in the past, it, it stayed about 96, 98% the same, maybe one or two changes here or there. I know that Junie, I think you're taking over from Mark on the Boulder Housing Partners uh, liaison, um, but if there's any other changes, maybe folks can announce those at that meeting. So let's talk a little bit about homework. Um, we, um, we would um, ask you guys to do a few things. First of all, um, we'd ask you to um, be thinking about changes in either process or um, in uh, the work plan. Um, we will um, uh, send an email out soliciting those and we'll probably ask you to get them into Taylor um, to aggregate um, so that we have those all in advance of the retreat. I think we, what we're trying to avoid is a situation where people are kind of surprising each other at the retreat. So we'd like to, we'll come up with a deadline of a bit before the retreat and Heather can there, uh, then organize things in a, in, in a logical fashion. And as Mary mentioned, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about process changes on the Friday night session and then the work plan on, on Saturday morning. And uh, so be thinking about what process changes you want and what, um, what work plan adjustments, if any, um, you'd like. And uh, we'll send a note out in the next week or so with uh, instructions how to get those over to staff for collection. The second item of homework, which we'll also send out an email, but we wanted to preview it for you tonight, is um, we, we wanna have a little bit of a discussion at the retreat on Friday afternoon um, about vulnerability. Um, what we would like people to do is reflect on your first year or this year, this past year on council for some of you, the first year, um, and, and talk about things that, that made you feel comfortable, things that made you feel uncomfortable. This was obviously a very weird year. Um, so there's gonna be, uh, definitely be a COVID overhang. Um, we're gonna send you a link to a TED talk um, by a woman who, who speaks very eloquently and, and it's not a very long session actually, it's on vulnerability and about the ability to, to be um, vulnerable and be candid and, and be exposed. And uh, we'd ask you to, to, to watch the video uh, it's only about 20 or 30 minutes long. And then um, share your, your, your views on your first year on council with Heather Bergman. Again, this will all be in an in a, um, email to you guys in the next couple of days. Heather, our facilitator, and uh, we'll prompt some questions for you to share with Heather. Heather will obviously keep those all confidential. We, we, we ask you to be as candid and as open as you can. And Heather will then summarize in a, um, those things and maybe um, capture themes and, um, and and see what trends we we come up with independently. And then what she's going to do um, is she'll pair us up. This will happen in December. She'll pair us up relatively randomly and um, ask us to get together with our partner um, in late December, early January by phone or video or, or even socially distant coffee or whatever you want to do 
and uh, and talk about some of the themes that Heather was is going to reflect back to you um, with with the idea that when we come to the retreat on that Friday afternoon, that you and your partner share um, what what you shared with each other, and we'll we'll listen to those pairings and and hear what people have to say. Again, we'll lay this all out in the email, but we wanted to at least give you kind of a heads up for that um, before that comes out. Um, anything else, Mary, that we haven't touched on? I think you got it, Bob. Okay, any questions for Mary? And the reason why Mary and I are presenting, just in case anyone's watching is, um, uh, Mary and I are, happen to be on the retreat committee this year. So we've been tasked to organize the retreat with Heather Bergman, our facilitator and the staff. Any questions of Mary or me or staff? Mirabai's got her hand up. Mirabai. So I'll just be letting uh, council and the community know I won't be attending this. Unfortunately, it was scheduled during um, my yearly business trip that is unmovable for us. Um, so in all the past years, the retreat has landed the week before, but unfortunately this year, I guess that's not the case. So um, I wish everyone wonderful talks and I'm sorry to miss out on my final year of, um, of, of this term. So. Great. And nearby, I think <clears throat> as we get closer and, and the agenda firms up, we'll be hoping that you can send in your thoughts to us so that we can uh, share them broadly with other council members who will see them and then also to read them for the community. So, sorry, you can't make it. Uh, any other issues? Any council members want to comment to Mary and Bob? Great, seeing none, then Mary, I think you've got the next item, um, salary adjustments for the city attorney and municipal judge. Yeah, thanks, um, Sam. So Sam and I are on the evaluation committee. And um, as you all probably know, um, we have been working with a consultant who sent out the evaluation surveys and um, then received them and then rolled them up into a summary for both the municipal judge and for city attorney. Um, so based on those and the status of our budget, um, the evaluation committee is recommending no raises, um, largely due to COVID. Um, and that's really it. Right, and so this is another item that uh, is going to need to have a motion and be part of the public hearing. So uh, if anyone would like to make a motion to accept the recommendation of the evaluation committee, that'd be great. So moved. Second. Great, any discussion? Let me see if there's hands up, All right, Aaron. Uh, well, I'd, I'd just like to, to thank um, uh, Tom and Linda for their service in an extremely difficult year. So thank you for everything you've done and for graciously accepting no salary increase based on the city's budget situation. Anyone else? I'll agree with Aaron. It's regrettable um, that across the board, there have been no salary adjustments this year due to our budget constraints and that applies to our city attorney and municipal judge. So um, it's regrettable, but it is where we're at. We have a motion and a second and we'll take a vote at the end of, after the public hearing at the end of matters. So then moving on to the last item, which is an item uh, added around COVID enforcement um, discussion and I'll turn to Rachel for that. This was a request that we got over hotline and added at CAC. Thanks, Sam. Um, well, and it's just following up on a discussion we started last week, which is um, in light of COVID cases spiraling, I think um, the governor is taking some additional steps today. And I imagine the county's looking at some steps, I think maybe in the uh, either that night or in the interim. Uh, the school shut down. And um, so I think there's some sense by the community that maybe the city could be doing more to suppress rates. And um, one thought I have is we haven't looked very hard at enforcement yet. And do we want to look at that either for now or assuming that um, it, 
I didn't, I don't know that the governor has indicated yet who's moving to the new level red, um, which is not going to be the same, I guess, as the old level red, which is now purple. But um, assuming that there's going to be some new limitations on what we can do, do we want to start looking at enforcing current rules, um, maybe, or at least having um, a message to the community that we will be doing more enforcement? Um, because at some point we will again, uh, hopefully be able to move back. And I would love for us to um, not move the whole community towards these more um, oppressive, safer to stay at home orders. And um, if we can encourage and facilitate people following the rules that will keep us safe in the first place. So again, my goal is just um, for us to consider whether there are some different things that we could be doing to encourage our community members to comply with the orders that we all need to be complying with to keep our community members safe. That's all I got. Okay, uh, Mark. I want to uh, support what Rachel has said. Uh, I know it's not our style in Boulder. We, we like to, to uh, act through persuasion, through education, uh, but we're in a situation here that none of us could have anticipated and is rapidly um, deteriorating. And so it, we ought to at least be having the conversation of what we can do uh, beyond what we have done to date, uh, whether it's feasible, whether uh, we can afford it, uh, and how we would implement it. And uh, I have nothing in particular in mind, but it, it's a conversation we ought to be having for all of the reasons that Rachel articulated. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I, Mark and Rachel, I guess what I would ask for is, are there specific asks that you would like to bring forward in this discussion now? Is it tickets? Under what circumstances? Like in particular, what what would you like council's action to be on this? I would love to maybe get consensus that we ask staff for recommendations for what we could do that would um, improve compliance. Uh, I certainly would not be in favor of um, anything uh, you know to do with jailing people. The county said last week that that's an option. I wouldn't want to go there, but um, it, you know, like we, we talked um, last week about the jail not being an option and so not having that as a stick. And, and I think that this is a little bit the same where the community knows that we're not, we're not really enforcing the health orders. Um, you know, there's, I think a, a bit of enforcement um, with some parties on the Hill kind of situations, but um, you know, you can pretty egregiously violate the health orders and expect that there won't be a consequence and, you know, contrast that with, if you're driving your car, you know you may um, run across a police officer who's gonna give you a ticket. And so right now I think we don't have much on any front that is seen as like a, a deterrent. And so could we put something in place that's a general deterrence? I don't think I'm the expert on knowing what's working um, around the country or the world to um, compassionately encourage compliance, but I would like to know what the options are and what has been effective because I, I think it might seem like it's compassionate um, to just kind of turn a blind eye towards um, egregious offenses, but what that does is cause the whole community to have to go into lockdown. So I don't really think it is greater good compassionate to, um, to not have, it, have much enforcement. And I would like to know what's working. So my request would be to, for staff or the experts to inform us. So if I were to distill that into what I understand about our process here, it would be a request for a nod of five to ask staff to do something. Um, and, and so I guess the first thing I do is turn to Chris and say, do you want to just give us a little bit of information about how you think about this and how staff is currently going about it? And then if you've heard what Rachel and Mark have said, is can you think of something above and beyond what you're doing now uh, as far as process that you would want to think about. Sure, thanks Sam and, and thanks Rachel and Mark. Um, I, I think there is actually enforcement that is happening. Um, 
uh, on a, a regular basis and there's enforcement coordination that occurs um, between the city, Boulder County Public Health and our surrounding agencies uh, every week um, in sharing information and sharing approaches. Um, and in fact, actually during the CU outbreak, um, one of the pieces of feedback from CDPHE was in fact that um, our enforcement model was um, recognized by CDPHE as um, one of the best working models in the state from that standpoint for that outbreak. We're obviously in a very different situation now um, with widespread community transmission of cases. So it is a different situation now. Um, and as, as was mentioned earlier, um, the, the new level red dial status um, will be uh, going into effect. Boulder County will be moving into that status on Friday. Um, CDPHE has, has um, informed us of that, our county. Uh, and with that, the, the, the most important um, aspect of that is there's, um, there's no allowance for gatherings. And that's where we continue to hear that, that um, spread is occurring is through social gatherings. Um, and, and as we've heard um, many people say, Jeff Zayak in, in our briefing has said, um, we all have COVID fatigue and it's really hard to, to continue. Uh, I know uh, all of us have had that experience of, you know, you all, you all of a sudden you start to realize your social circles uh, probably getting a little too big. So right now we're in a crucial time to eliminate those to try and um, help slow the, the spread of the virus. I think what, um, what we can do is um, take this conversation back to our team and look to see if there is any additional approaches. There's also, um, as we're getting into the holiday season, um, trying to look at as, as folks are out and about trying to um, either do their shopping or uh, hopefully do some of that in terms of curbside pickup of local, local stores. Um, if there are other ways that we can improve our enforcement, I think then we could come back and share that information uh, at the December 1st COVID briefing, um, if that would be helpful. Um, as we have shared before, we have very limited resources, especially in the police department, um, to, uh, to be um, writing, writing tickets or dedicating officer resources to, uh, to that. They, they do have to prioritize their calls uh, for service around the city based on their severity. Um, and so um, I, I don't want to make any promises that there will be significant changes, but I, I think it is worth asking our team if there are any other approaches, especially because of the change in dial status. Um, uh, I think there will be uh, an increased desire or increased um, need for information to answer questions um, from the community. So those are my thoughts, Sam. All right, thank you, Chris. So would that work for council? I'll just put out there broadly for um, staff to go on with the dial change that's coming, talk about enforcement and then come back and present it to us at the beginning of December. And Mary, I see your hand up and then um, I see lots of thumbs up with that too. Yeah, um, I just have, uh, just wanted to request that um, if Chris could please just um, summarize what the changes are going to be with the new um, level that we'll be, we'll be going to on Friday, just so that people that are watching are aware. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, with the, the changes that are occurring, the, as I mentioned before, the, the biggest change is um, the prohibition of, of any kind of gatherings. The other really significant change is um, indoor dining is, is going to be closed um, and only takeout curbside uh, delivery or to-go is allowed or outdoor dining um, with um, only people in your own household will be allowed. Um, then for certain types of, of uses like office uses, remote work is strongly encouraged and the capacity limit drops from 25% to 10%. Um, 
The other item is gyms or fitness areas drop to a 10% capacity or um, a maximum of 10 people per room indoors um, or uh, outdoors and then reservations are also required. Um, the kind of group sports or gatherings are also limited um, and uh, outdoor uh, or indoor events are also limited. Um, so like indoor unseated events are, are now closed. So um, there is a great summary table that describes all of this that we can email out to um, council that's on the CDPHE website. Uh, and I know our partners in, in public health and our communication staff are uh, actively working to start to um, compile all of this information and get it out to uh, the community and to um, our partners and businesses. Thank you, Chris. And I just have um, just a, one quick question. Will there be any additional precautions that will be recommended for essential workers who cannot work remotely? And, you know, like, for example, the people that are waiting tables on the tables that are limited to two households, their exposure will be to two times however many turns of the table there are. So are there any extra precautions that will be recommended? I will ask uh, Boulder County Public Health that question. I, I don't know at this point as the info is still unfolding, but I will ask that uh, and, and then we'll be able to let you know. Thank you, Chris. Okay. I've got Adam, Aaron, and Rachel. Adam? Thanks, Sam. Uh, one of my questions is gonna be in regards to what are the current ticketing or fining amounts for gatherings? And, you know, something that tends to get people's attention is when those are pretty high and it makes it kind of like a news story. So uh, that may be an area to look into. Also, um, for repeat offenses, you know, if these are rental properties, maybe the potential of losing a rental license because of those repeat offenses. Um, I think we're almost to that point. Um, if that is legal, obviously, that's just a suggestion, but uh, wouldn't want to do anything illegal. So the maximum I, I, for a public health water violation for the city is $1,000. Uh, the judge generally imposes something less than that, sometimes with some suspended. We are in the process of working with on 13 different properties going through our public nuisance ordinance um, to uh, take away the rental licenses from those properties. Uh, we're, we've only reached the second stage for one of those right now. Uh, and after the, second, after the second stage was a settlement meeting, we then can go and ask for removal of the license. Most, most of the places where we went that gave the first stage notice complied after we gave the first stage notice. Thanks for that, Tom. That's super helpful. Aaron and then Rachel, Aaron. Well, I just wanted to say I support uh, Rachel, uh, Rachel's request and Mark's uh, echoing of that. So um, Chris, thanks for your responsiveness there. I know resources are limited, but um, we're reaching levels of essentially unchecked community spread of the virus right now. Mm -hmm. So um, some more enforcement um, seems like an appropriate thing to be doing right now. Okay. Uh, so Rachel, your hands come in and out multiple times. So I'll turn to you. I meant to unmute myself there and instead I lowered my hand. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing for Chris as well, which is that um, obviously we want to be um, as data backed as possible. So it seems like um, people quickly passing each other on a trail is not a way that COVID is spreading. Whereas somebody, you know, the gatherings that are inside or even outside if they're lengthy are spreading. So um, targeting the options and advice for where we can make the most impact is, you know, we've also heard stories about um, businesses who are um, taking down the signs that say you need a mask and things like that. So, um, you know, sort of the egregious violations that are most likely um, to lead to scenarios where um, COVID spreads is what I would be most interested in, in looking at enforcing personally. Thanks. Great. And I'll just make a note or staff that when we have our next CAC before our December 1st meeting, we will probably need to extend the COVID briefing to accommodate um, your report out on this discussion. Um, I, I will say, and I don't disagree with any of these concerns, obviously these are um, tough times. We're at levels we've never seen before. 
And, you know, enforcement is one component of a spectrum of things we need to be doing, some of which I think need to, we need to be thinking differently than what we've done so far. And I want to say that I think staff is doing this routinely. I mean, I, as I've talked to Chris and we've done our um, public uh, COVID briefings or, and you know, have different council members speak, I've stayed in touch with staff and it really does seem like staff is brainstorming every week about new things we can do. And, you know, ever since September and the, the CU spike started, there's been pretty much a constant evaluation, reevaluation of the steps we're taking. So um, I look forward to more of it at the, the health briefing on the first. Um, and, you know, one of the unfortunate things I read today is that historically with things like the HIV scourge and some of the other scourges, it is very hard to get people to comply. Um, whether it's enforcement or education, it is just always a challenge. So these, every time we change in our dial is an opportunity for us to remind people, <laughs> if this is serious, there's a vaccine coming. If we can, everybody we can get across that vaccine finish line is a life saved. So everything we can do in our personal networks as well is important. One of the things the governor said to me and I wanna pass on to you is you're all leaders in your community um, and people look up to you and listen to you and you've all got networks. So it's well worth um, as we move to a different dial status to remind people of what's at stake here. And that means all of us doing that. So thanks for bringing this up, Rachel. I think we've got a plan. Karen, I still see your hand up. Do you have something else? Okay, um, very good. Thank you um, to staff for that. And then, let me pull up. My... So one thing Debbie reminded me, we formally, we need a motion to approve the 21 council meeting calendar as we amended it. Could I get somebody to move that? So moved. Second. Very good. So we've got that. And then I was doing something here. Let me pull this up. I, and so that is the last of our um, matters here. So we need to open a public hearing at which people can speak to either 8A, which is the mayor pro tem, 8B, which is the um, 2021 council meeting calendar, and 8D which is the salary adjustments for the city attorney and municipal judge. Um, Debbie has informed me we only have one speaker at public comment and that's Lynn Siegel. Lynn, you should be able to unmute. And Lynn, you have three minutes. And I wonder why we don't have one, why we just have one person signed up here. I don't wonder, I'm being facetious. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. You can all hear me and you will all let me know if you, if my audio is distorted in any way, correct? Yes. Okay. I don't support Junie Joseph for the mayor pro tem position. I made it clear in my letter to you, which you probably haven't read because it's about 20 pages long, probably, that the issue with Bob Yates and Junie setting up the process for the process for the police master plan process subcommittee, the two people that were assigned to that, one of which was Mallory, who is um, in charge of the police, very involved in the activity of the police, um, uh, homeless shelter raids, etc. cetera. And um, as I described in my letter to you, I brought up with Junie, the Zade Atkinson affair, um, Sammy Lawrence, and the issue of um, Officer Lolotai long before he was fired, I've requested him to be fired. And um, I think after Black Lives Matter issues coming up as the virus engulfed us this summer, it becomes more and more evident that we need to do something. Now, as far as Junie being black, 
I really don't care if Junie is an elephant or if she's yellow or green or what color she is. This is not about color. This is about my feelings about her and her abilities and the way she thinks and the way I think. Now, I lived with a black family on a perfectly white island in Seattle, Mercer Island. And they were about the only black family on the friggin' island. But I agreed politically with this woman that was in that household, and that's why I lived there when my mother died of leukemia. From Rocky Flats, probably. Just saying. So that's my feeling uh, about having Junie take this position. Um, I think that in this community, you really need to have been here for a while, and you really need to understand what's going on here before you take such a high level position. Um, although she's just, she's going to be on council agenda committee. She's going to be doing some things. And the, the culture here has got a big problem with Bob Yates and his influence. And then Sam Weaver enhancing that influence and the XL franchise situation and see you thank, south. Thank you, Lynn. All thank of you, it Lynn. Your, your, okay. time, your time is up. Thank you. Okay, so with that, um, we will bring this back to council and we have three motions we will take a vote on. The first motion is to um, vote on Judy Joseph as mayor pro tem for the coming year. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, Junie Joseph, congratulations, condolences. You are Mayor Pro Tem for the coming year. Thanks for taking it on. And Junie, maybe you could say a few words. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to thank my fellow council members. I would also like to thank Bob for inspiring me because of the great job he has done as Mayor Pro Tem. Bob works tirelessly and quietly amid criticism from both community members and even council members. Ultimately, it is you, the entire council, that I will be serving. So thank you for providing me with such an opportunity. I promise not to take the work for granted and to be diligent and reflective in my duties. And I look forward to your continuous engagement and support after all, as Mary often said, we are all in this together. <laughs> but in sum, I wanted to add something. You know, as the new mayor pro tem, I represent the whole of Boulder. Whether you're a Democrat, whether you're Republican, whether you're plain Boulder, better Boulder, open Boulder, and all the, the other Boulder groups in between, I'm here to serve all of you. And thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Well said. Okay, we'll move on to our next motion, which is motion to approve the 2021 council meeting calendar. Um, is there anyone who does not want to approve the um, 2021 meeting calendar as moved? Seeing none, that motion passes unanimously. And then our final motion is uh, to approve the um, no raises for the city attorney and mis municipal judge. Is there anyone who wants to vote against that motion? Seeing none, that passes unanimously. So that brings us to the end of our business. I'll turn back to council uh, for a debrief. Is there anything anyone else would like to say? Adam. Yeah, I just wanted to thank staff and CAC for making those adjustments to the, the public hearing portion of council matters uh, super quickly. Obviously, this is pretty late, so I don't think we'll ever get a whole bunch of input. But, uh, you know, we addressed the process as best we could in a very short amount of time, and I really appreciate that. Great. Thank you, Adam. And, and just for everyone, we'll return to this at the retreat and see if there's a way we can do it even better. Okay, well, seeing no other comments, I will gavel the meeting closed. Thank you all so much for your time and thank you to staff for a great meeting. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.
Bancário. Increasingly under personal attack.